Here. Myers? Here. Thompson? Here. Williams? Here. Weiniger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving into DCSD Spotlight, Superintendent Kane will talk to us about Colorado 5A Athletic Director of the Year and 2024 Outstanding Teacher Award. Terrific, thank you and good evening everyone. Um, we have a couple of incredible staff members to recognize tonight. So first, I'd love to have Rob Johnson, Athletic Director and Assistant Principal from Chaparral High School. Please join me up front, along with Principal Greg Gochi and uh, Athletic Director, uh, Director of Athletics and Activities, Derek Cheney. Come on up. Rob here was recently named the Colorado 5A Athletic Director of the Year by the Colorado Athletic Directors Association. This prestigious recognition is a testament to Mr. Johnson's outstanding con contributions and unwavering dedication to high school athletic. He will be formally recognized by CADA in late April. Congratulations to Rob on this honor. So first of all, how about a round of applause for Rob Johnson? Rob, why don't you talk a little bit about what this means for you? Thank you. I wasn't quite ready for that, but um, <laughs> it means a lot. Honestly, it means a lot because the school and that community of Chaparral means a ton to me. It's where I started in 2000, and, and that's how every AD in our league is. They care about their schools in our, in our district. They care about their schools, their community. We're all supported, crazy support. I got my wife, Wendy, who's also an educator here in the, in the, in the district, and my youngest daughter is here, Ava, and she's got a sister that's in soccer practice right now. They're both athletes and students in the school, and um, it's our family. It's what we do, and uh, so it does mean a lot, so I appreciate that. That's fantastic. Principal Gochi. Well, I was going to start with a joke, and so if you... so. Rob is often out of the building because of the amount of work that he has to do that takes him out. So not only is he covering going to meetings and that, that sort of thing, but he's also got a, a, a load of teachers to evaluate and he's got a load of students to pay attention to and make sure they're acting right. So we call him PT for part-time. And so how a guy gets an award <laughs> like this being part-time is amazing to me. But, um, you know, truthfully, Rob was one of the first people I met when I came to Chaparral, um, and the dedication that he has for the students in our school and the students across the district is unwavering and outstanding. And his girls were in, you know, whatever, second grade and first grade probably, and we've got to see them grow up. The oldest is a senior and going off to hopefully play a little college soccer. Uh, also was a star on our foot flag football team. And Ava here's the star on our, our volleyball team as well. I, I wanted to say basketball, but that's just because that's the season we're in. But anyway, um, Rob, you've meant a, a ton to this school, and recognition of this comes because of a long-standing career of paying attention to the details and championing our school. And you don't get it your first year, so thank you so much for all you've done. This is the hardest job in show business right here. Yeah, I just want to uh, echo a few things that have been said already. Just, uh, you know, Rob is such a, a humble leader in our, our district. And um, for those of you who don't know, he, he is one of the leaders in the state of Colorado. Like, like he really is. I mean, it's not just, it's, it's way bigger than Douglas County and Chaparral. And not many people know that unless, you know, when he's gone halftime, he really is elsewhere. So he's, uh, he, he's on the CADA board. Uh, he's highly involved. Uh, people call Rob. They respect him around the state. And so I want to make sure that lens is seen, too, that we're really fortunate to have uh, someone in our own district that's a leader in the state of Colorado. And so I uh, just appreciate your leadership, your humbleness, the way you carry yourself. Uh, Rob and I go way back. So we, we may or may not have coached together way back in the day. And uh, I let Rob win a few of those games there, and so so, and 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 Rob did bring us a state championship as a basketball coach too. So I know that's not the honor tonight, but that was a sure fun back. But uh, just thank you for all your hard work, Rob. Much deserved. Director Weininger is going to give you your certificate, and then we'll take a picture, 
And I am looking forward to seeing the Chaparral boys play in the playoffs on Thursday at basketball. Really, really exciting how much, how far they've gone and how much they've done. Congratulations. Okay. Now we're going to celebrate one of our incredible elementary school teachers. Would Susan Irwin, STEAM teacher from Pioneer Elementary School, please join me up front along with her principal, Gina Landis. Susan recently received the 2024 Outstanding Teacher Award from, the Colorado, from Colorado Agriculture in the Classroom. This prestigious award recognizes Ms. Irwin's exceptional efforts in integrating agriculture into her classroom curriculum, fostering agriculture literacy, and inspiring students to become conscientious tr contributors to a sustainable global society. And just as an aside, as someone who's very passionate about the sciences and STEM in our elementary schools, um, I just want to personally thank you for inspiring kids every single day. We're very, very proud of you. So how about a round of applause for Susan? I would love to say something. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful award. Um, our pioneer community is so proud of Susan Irwin. Um, she has brought her special magic to pioneer for over 15 years, first as a librarian and then as a STEAM teacher. Um, she, like so many people in Douglas County, we really started out as ranching and farming. But where our little Pioneer Elementary School is, it now has Kohl's and Costco and, you know, we do have a Trader Joe's, but we have kind of ha don't have all of that great agriculture as much. And so Susan has done such a beautiful job of bringing that agriculture into our schools and really reminding us of our roots. Um, she has brought guest speakers in. Our students have been exposed to oxen and deer and um, wild turkeys and um, a myriad of different things, things like Pueblo chilies and peaches and crops that some kids have never tried before. Um, Susan also incorporates science into everything that she does. Um, her specials has robots and coding, hydroponics, many more things. And finally, Susan creates an amazing fun space for our students, which is the greatest. Um, Susan started over 10 years ago the Chicken Tender Program. So our chicken tenders tend chickens. These are our fifth grade students and they have the honor of becoming tenders. It's a very prestigious event at our school. We love it. But Susan started this. So not only does Susan bring all these wonderful science and incorporate it daily into whatever she does, but she makes things fun and enjoyable and creates these magical memories that they always will remember. So thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Susan, what does this award mean to you? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here to share this special time. Um, I have notes because I'm nervous, if that's okay. <laughs> Receiving the 2024 Outstanding Teacher Award from Colorado Agriculture in the Classroom has honestly it's been overwhelming, humbling, gratifying, um, all, all of the feels. Um, the recognition holds great significance for me. From my perspective, agricultural literacy extends far beyond farming connecting with our daily lives through food, clothing, and many other everyday items. Integrating agricultural literacy into my STEAM curriculum has not only heightened our students' appreciation of agriculture, but it has given them, given them a growing passion. I've seen their passion grow in science and technology, and um, most of all, in sustainability. And um, that's gratifying for me to, to watch. Um, the honor of receiving this award extends way far beyond my personal achievements. Um, it's a true testament to the support, the unwavering support I feel from my pioneer community. This is going to make me cry, I'm sorry. From my pioneer community, um, my principal, Gina Landis, 
um, my dedicated colleagues, and most of all the students who inspire me every single day. Um, I, I wouldn't be up here without that support. Um, I've been given a lot of leeway to do some of the fun things I've been able to do for our students and that means a whole lot. So I really look forward to continuing this journey of education and exploration with the students and the staff and the administration that I love at Pioneer. So thank you for encouraging all of this. I appreciate it. Susan, thank you so much for everything that you do and for inspiring our children every single day. How about one more round of applause? <laughs> Director Thompson has your certificate and we'll do a picture. And that concludes tonight's recognitions. Thank you. Congrats again. Moving on to item number six, the acceptance of agenda. The recommendation is that the board approves the agenda as, agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Move to adopt the agenda. Second. Motion by Geiger, second by Weiniger. Roll call, Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passes 7-0. On to superintendent reports. Terrific. Thank you so much. I have some brief reports for tonight. Um, first of all, our hiring season for the 24-25 school year officially launches on March 1st. Last Friday, we held a DCSD job fair um, at our legacy campus for teachers and licensed special education service providers. The event was a great success. We had over 70 candidates in attendance. Um, many of our staff, including our principals and assistant principals, and of course our student support services team were on hand to talk to candidates, and we are just so excited about the many candidates that we got. One story I heard is that one of the candidates um, stated that DCSD is where she wanted to work, so much so that she was canceling her attendance at other district fairs and was throwing all in with DCSD. So we just love to hear that. Um, we are super excited about the success of our basketball teams in our school district. Bo both the boys and the girls are down to the final eight, which is the quarterfinals in the Chassa State Playoffs this week. Um, we have seven girls and boys basketball teams participating in the Elite Eight, 6A and 5A basketball tournaments. So congratulations and good luck to all of our teams on Thursday and Friday. I think I told the Board of Education I was receiving updates on um, how our teams were doing during our board retreat last Saturday for my husband who kept telling me, and another DCSD team wins, and another one. So that was really fun. Um, DCSD also has five state champions in 5A state wrestling, four from Ponderosa and one from Douglas County High Schools. Many other placed in the top 10 for both boys and girls wrestling. So congratulations to our wrestlers. Um, and of course, our spring sports are off to a great start, which started yesterday, um, February 26th. So good luck to all of our spring athletes. This past weekend, um, DCSD high school students participated in the state DECA competition. Results will be announced later this week, so stay tuned. The Technology Students Association state competition was last week, and we had multiple students from our high schools who won in their designated competition area. For our community members, preschool registration opens on Tuesday, February 29th. This is a fantastic opportunity for families to enroll their little ones in a nurturing and stimulating early childhood educational environment. We are really excited to announce that our program hours for four-year-olds is going to 15 hours a week starting next year. It will be Monday through Friday. We are still offering a 10 hour a week program in the morning for all of our three-year-olds. Um, tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. on February 28th will be the monthly Parent University webinar. This month's topic is DCSD's Substance Use and Prevention Pilot Program for Middle Schools. The webinar is being taught by Kel being led by Kelly Smith, our own Director of Health, Wellness, and Prevention. 
our Douglas County Special Education Advisory Council uh, Committee, known as DCCAC, is accepting nominations for its Shining Stars Awards. Shining Stars are DCSD staff members and schools nominated for outstanding service by the parents and or caregivers of students receiving special education services. Please be sure to nominate your Shining Star by Thursday, February 29th at www.dcseac.org, dcseac.org. On March 7th, we are hosting an information meeting for parents about the Ascent program at the Legacy Campus. The Accelerating Students Through Concurrent Enrollment, Ascent, is a fifth year high school program that allows students to participate in concurrent enrollment the year after 12th grade, enroll in post-secondary courses where they will earn college credit at no tuition cost to them and their families. So we encourage our families to come check out this amazing program. The Douglas County Youth Initiative is accepting nominations for Outstanding Youth Award. This recognizes teenagers between the age of 13 and 19 who have overcome personal adversity and created positive change in their lives. The Youth Awards focuses on teenagers who have triumphed over great odds and serves as in, serve as inspiration and role models. If you know young people who would be good candidates for the Outstanding Youth Award, please help identify them by completing the nomination form on the Douglas County um, Colorado website. So that's Douglas County versus the school district. The Apple Awards are coming up on Saturday, March 30th. This is one of my favorite events of the entire year when we get to recognize our amazing educators and staff. The deadline to purchase tickets is Friday, March 8th, and more information is available on the Foundation for Douglas County Schools website. Um, I do want to share with our board and our public that funding from the recent Mill Levy override has enabled us to increase safety and security in our schools via additional safety personnel such as school resource officers and campus security specialists. Hiring is in the work for these positions and many of our campus security specialists are already in place at our elementary schools. The rest will be in place for the 24-25 school year. We also want to express our sincere gratitude to our law enforcement partners. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office, Castle Rock Police Department, Lone Tree Police Department, and Parker Police Department for their support of additional school resource officers. Um, all of them are in the process of working to hire additional school resource officers to take care of our district. In addition, the county commissioners recently voted on a 3-0 vote to contribute additional funds in order to maximize the number of SROs we are able to hire with the passage of 5A. We are so grateful for our community's dedication to the safety of our schools, our students, and our staff. I will be spending Friday at the Capitol building with some of my superintendent colleagues meeting with lawmakers to advocate for funding for our school district. So I'm really looking forward to a productive day to talk about school funding. And finally, I just wanted to um, let the public know with respect to the consent agenda, um, I wanna clarify that the CBRE agreement is with our real estate agent um, and is necessary in order for us to gather information about potentially purchasing a property. The agreement with our real estate agent in no way means we will purchase the property. It only allows our agent to go and do due diligence for us so that they can bring um, forward to the board the information the board would need to make a decision. So I just wanted to clarify that that was not an agreement to purchase anything, only an agreement to get our agents out and researching. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on to item eight, public comment. Tonight, three minutes will be allotted for each speaker. Please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests or staff in the room. We also ask that all public comment is appropriate for a K-12 audience. Um, we will start with the student advisory group, both Jake and Nanda. Um, hello, can you hear me? Hi, Jake. Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so we have had a productive last few days, and we're going to start with the board retreat that happened on Saturday. Um, at this time, we're not able to provide 
incredible detail into next year. But we can say that we'll, we will be moving toward a more feedback-based model um, with more feedback going toward the board on policies that they're considering every, um, every two weeks or every month. Beyond that, um, we are also considering restructuring how SAG works and we'll provide you with more updates in the future. I'm going to hand it over to Nanda for a moment to talk about um, her section. Um, yeah, so just kind of looking back on our meeting yesterday, um, we had the opportunity to listen to the pollster come in and talk to us, um, and we're just talking a little bit about 5A and 5B, and just some feedback from the students that we noticed was um, it would be important to highlight more relevant um, information to students and families, um, and maybe more condensed information that's easier to understand when you're trying to reach a wider audience um, and especially using social media to reach a greater audience and especially when it comes to students um, that's widely used. And another thing we're kind of doing now with SAG is we're starting to look forward to next year's leadership. Um, so we've opened up the applications for students and so we're beginning to start that process and so should have an update for you um, within the next month on that as well. We're just going to close off with an update about presentations to the Board of Education and the Superintendent's Cabinet. Um, we have now given groups feedback prepared di by Director Meek about how to tailor their presentations towards policies and end statements. Um, most of the groups have adopted these changes. A few of them have chosen to remain operationally based due to the specific nature of their proposals. But we are confident in saying right now that we will have both operational and policy presentations in April. We have the date set for April 23rd, the April 23rd board meeting for our policy. And for our operational, we are looking at other dates that week. As always, you can contact us with any <gasps> questions and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. All right, on to in person. We'll start with Jeremiah Ganzi, followed by Nevaeh Ganzi, and then Lacey Ganzi. Hello again, Douglas County. I'm here again to speak on a bill that has recently been signed that could help keep students of protected classes safe in schools. This bill, SB 23-296, was passed by our governor on August 7th of last year, and it agrees to offer training to staff and improved reporting systems to help prevent racism. We believe this bill can help bring the change we've been looking for in these schools since these events began. While this bill isn't to be enforced until July this year, we're asking you as a district to adopt this bill into your code of conduct before this date. With the proper implementation, students will feel safer on campus and discrimination will start to fade. We also wanna see schools work together with parents to establish tolerance by teaching kids what's right and what's wrong to say. And this bill will help punish and educate kids who are intolerant. We hope you'll hear us and consider these terms to provide students with a safer environment to learn in. And to the parents, we hope you'll lead your kids to in the right direction to end hate for kids now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Nevea Ganzi, Lacey Ganzi, and then Marietta Hawkins. Hi, I'm Nevaeh Ganzi and I'm here today again asking what you are doing as a district to implement Law SB-23-296. This went into law August 7th, 2023 and students continue to face racism and discrimination. 
and harassment in your schools? How do you plan on protecting your youth from these kind of issues? We are not the first or the last family that will stand up here demanding you to protect your students from racial discrimination, harassment, and hate crimes within schools. So I'm asking you, Douglas County School District, what are you gonna do as a district to stop and end these issues in your school? Your youth is suffering. And it's not fair. Lacey Gansey, Marietta Hawkins, and Aonte Anderson. Hello, Douglas County School Board. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I would love to first share, given the past year's fight for my children, I am coming to you with a very different approach. I have learned how exhausting your political jobs can be. I have fought for my kids nonstop, day in and day out, for exactly one year. I would love to start today by saying I'm eager to be able to speak to you coming with this different approach today. I come to you today very humble, broken, and as just a mom in your community. A mother just like many of you in this room and on that board, I believe I can speak for any parent in this state, in any city, in any community in America. We would all say that we, wanna, we would hope for a safer tomorrow for all of these children in any school. It was recently just brought to my attention when we discovered the bill on August 7th, 2023, that addressed all the things that I believe I've been standing in here speaking about. I stood in day in and day out on the front lawn of this building and in front of this board, pleading to bring these things to life. When this bill was brought to my attention and I read it for word for word, it was the first time in this year that something made sense to me politically. There was not one thing I would change or one thing that I would ask different. I would just ask for it to be read and for it to be considered that since it became law on August 7th of 2023, that we may not be able to reach all the financial standpoints or obstacles that we may reach. But as far as just training our staff to be better people, and putting in a safety result for these kids and giving them a phone number and access to somewhere to report, we are showing them we care. With that being said, I would also love to say that I see a bill coming for review on March 6th, 2024. And this one is SB, sorry, I'll have to get back to the number. SB 23-2096, this will piggyback, piggyback on that, but also push the law out further to make the 23-2096 not be in account till 2025. Everything in this law seems to also coincide with the 23-2096 approach, so I don't see why we can't come together and for a first time in Douglas County history be proactive instead of reactive. These kids that are coming up from the middle school into high school are the bravest kids that I've seen even from before I was a student and they come with such power. To stand up in this state in a community where everyone sees Douglas County as the entitled community or someone that just 15 seconds turns remaining. a blind eye, I think that you as, a, as an administration have the ability to really look at this bill and implement just certain parts of it and consider every time that me and my family and other students have stood before you. Thank you for taking your time to listen to us. Thank you. Marietta Hawkins, Aonte Anderson, then Midian Holmes. Madam President, members of the board, I am the Honorable Leonte Anderson, former Denver School Board member, and trust me, there is any place that I'd rather be than here tonight. Um, I wish I was not here in Douglas County, but because of the ongoing uh, situations where black students in your schools do not feel safe, they have, com they have asked members from various communities to come and support them. First, I want to be able to, again, or to begin with acknowledging Black History Month. I'm disappointed that I sat through a school board meeting and I even looked at your agenda for your previous meeting and none of you acknowledged that this month is Black History Month. Your students, your black students deserve to be acknowledged, especially knowing that their contributions both we come from struggle but also triumph in this country's history. I, I am really struggling with how a board of education is silent when 
whip cracking noises are played in your halls. When black students are walking in their hallways and their white counterparts have an app on their phone where a whip crack will then be made, a noise will be made when they pass them or when they're called names that rhyme with the word bigger. You can, f you can figure out what that means. And since we do have this opportunity to talk about black history, I just want you all to be able to remember that black Americans' story in this country began on a slave auction block. Acknowledging that their existence as humans were not equal. Laws saying that they're only three-fifths of a human. Laws passed that they could not read. A civil war had about not, you know, some folks would say it was just over states' rights. No, it's actually around enslavement. We continue on to Jim Crow. We think, that we think things are going to continue to get better. We still have ongoing racism. We still have the summer of 2020. And students in your district still don't feel safe. You should be ashamed of yourselves. And so my hope is that you all will take the necessary steps and actions to simply change your handbook, to implement the Senate bill that's been mentioned, so that people can stop coming to this board meeting. Trust me, we don't like to come to you. I'll be very honest with you. It's just, it's really simple. Now, I'm not asking you to ad adopt the, the changes that some of you would deem radical of Denver Public Schools, which I wish you would, but I know you're not going to. But at least you can say, hey, we have a problem and we're going to fix it. So I'll leave you with these words from Maya Angelou. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. And to a daybreak that is wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. 15 seconds Thank remaining. You. Nonverbals matter, Erin. I want you to hopefully pay attention. Um, I admire the distinction that the Lacey or the Gansey family came to you all with, with humility. Um, today, I'm going to offer you all some hard truths. But it's a very simple concept. No one's story is fiction. In a world that we are, where we are inundated with narratives, there are undeniable whispers of truth that oftentimes don't fit into a preconceived notion of reality. And it's my hope that in the moments that you all spend alone in your leadership, you are hearing those whispers and, the, and they haunt you because these voices are being ignored. And I hope that really does resonate with you. So as a commitment to the history that is being written in these times of your leadership, I'm gonna share with you a letter that I've written to my granddaughter to be opened on February 27th, 2020. She will be 18 years old and my hope is that you all will be obsolete. Dear Luna, as I write this letter to you, my heart is heavy with the weight of history and the lessons it carries. I share with you stories of leaders from the past who went by the names Aaron Kane, Brad Geiger, Susan Meek, Becky Myers, Tim Moore, Valerie Thompson, Christy Williams, and Kaylee Winnegar. These dismaying leaders wielded their responsibility, not for the betterment of humanity, but for their own selfish desires. They chose racism over peace, division over unity, hatred over love. And it is crucial that we remember their actions, not to glorify them, but to ensure that when their names are called upon, they are remembered with disdain. Each of them perpetuated systems of oppression and discrimination. They built walls instead of bridges, fanning the flames of hatred rather than extinguishing them. Their legacies are marred by the suffering that, inflict, that was inflicted upon countless lives. But amidst their irresponsibility, there were also beacons of hope. I stood with the community and families who pushed against the tide of bigotry and intolerance. We fought for equity, justice, and unity. Our courage and resilience serve as a testament to the power of compassion and empathy. My dear Luna, when you retell this story, do it with your head high and your fists up. None of you are immune to history, and it will not be kind to you if you do not do the right thing. Tonight, I yielded a personal invitation from the governor to be a part of a celebration. Aaron, I heard you talk about going down to the legislation to talk about funding for remaining. the schools, the school district here. I look forward to telling my contacts and my platform 
that maybe your voice should be ignored the way that you've ignored these families. Do better, Douglas County. Kevin Mitchell, Steph Jester, and then Reverend Lauren Grubaugh Thomas. Kevin Mitchell. Steph Jester. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Evening. I don't even know what time it is, but it's evening. It's snowy. My name is Steph Jester. I am a Douglas County new parent. Um, I have a kiddo at Roxboro and another one who will be joining. Um, I'm here today because I am dismayed um, by the lack of accountability and action that this board in Douglas County has taken, the lack of action taken to stand against racism, to stand with your students who are black. As Ayante said, it's Black History Month. What message is being communicated to the black students when it's not acknowledged here at the top where it starts? Students are continuing to be targeted because of their race. This is not acceptable. I will not accept this. And I'm gonna be here for 12 more years. <laughs> I, will, I look forward to working together. But if you don't take a stand, I will continue to be here to call you out and to say, guys, if you don't take a stand, you are sitting in complicity with racism. I will leave you with a quote from David Ruggles, part of the abolitionist movement. He said, these matters concern everyone who values freedom and justice. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is the Reverend Lauren Grubaugh Thomas. I'm an Episcopal priest. I live and serve in Sterling Ranch, where my husband and I are the parents of twin two-year-old girls. We're an interracial couple who moved to Douglas County two years ago, having bought a house with some reluctance to move into this county because of the stories we had heard of racism in Douglas County. Racism that includes a long history and a recent history of white supremacist groups, including the Klan. And when you have that kind of egregious racism, then it is always true that there are pernicious forms of racism that are able to thrive because they get relativized. So, I was moved into action when I heard the Gansey family's invitation to join them in contending for justice in this district as a faithful means of honoring Black History Month. One of the primary reasons that we study history is to shine a light on the violence of the past in order to prevent it from carrying over into the future. The Ganseys have acted with great courage by sharing their history here, illuminating painful truths about the ways racism continues to fester in Douglas County and in our schools. I hope we can agree that all of our children ought to be safe to learn and free to grow up to be contributing members of our community. And if we want these things for all our children, then history has taught us that we must ensure our black children, in particular, are safe and free. And to this end, our state has legislation in place to protect students from discrimination and harassment. This district already has an educational equity policy, and the Gansey family has rightfully asked for the implementation of these policies and legislation in such forms as a definition of a hate crime in the student handbook and access to a victim advocate. But it's not enough for policies to simply exist. Civil rights elder Ruby Sales has said that many of the achievements of the civil rights movement have been stripped bare in recent years because hearts remained unchanged. In this district, we need both policy enacted and hearts transformed. I speak tonight to urge you, members of the board, to open your hearts, to let them move you to act as good students of history as we encourage all remaining. our students to be, in order to align your intentions for a safe, positive culture with a faithful implementation and enforcement 
of racially just policies that will allow that culture to become our shared reality. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Iverson, Matthew Smith, and then Amit Gupta. Thank you, board, for hearing us tonight. I understand that you can't talk about the collective lawsuit that includes the Gansey students and many others. I understand these legal proceedings can take years to resolve. In the meantime, though, you all can have, have an opportunity to make certain no other students in DCSD ever experience the devastating impact that these and many other learners have endured. There must be clear, purposeful intention, acts to change lifetimes of discrimination against people of color. We've lived with racism in these United States for centuries. The first step is acknowledging that there is racism in our schools. I remember watching South Pacific. It's been a while, but I rewatched it recently. There's a song that is as poignant now as it was then. These are the lyrics. You've got to be taught to hate and to fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ears. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. DCSD can commit to teach how to promote care for each and every learner, including the adult ones. Senate Bill 24-162, Best Practices to Prevent Discrimination in Schools, will have a hearing on March 6th. DCSD can make a purposeful movement to have their lobbyists testify in support and begin the work to include all students in their efforts to be a world-class educational provider. I urge you all to be teachable. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Smith, followed by Amit Gupta, and then we'll move to remote. I don't see Matt. Amit Gupta. Hello, directors. My name is Amit Gupta. I'm a resident of Highlands Ranch. Uh, here to talk about 5A. Uh, in 2023, DCSD asked voters to vote on ballot measures 5A and 5B and told property owners it would cost them $200 for a $1 million home if both 5A and 5B passed. Only 5A passed, so presumably the cost for 5A alone should be less than $200 for a $1 million home. Certainly it shouldn't be greater than that. And certainly it shouldn't be double that, but the cost is indeed double that. $400 per million dollar, uh, per, per $1 million of home value for only 5A. Since I only have three minutes, I'll try to keep things short. I have multiple examples of what DCSD has stated, but here, for example, it says, how much will it cost if both a 66 million MLO and 484 million bond are approved by voters, it will cost $200 per year for a $1 million home. All right. Uh, here I have the mills certified by the Board of County Commissioners. And for that $66,189,611 to the district for 5A, it's 6.370 mills. So we know the impact of 5A is 6.37 mills. We can go to any home 
look at their property value and see how much that costs. So I went to all of the seven districts that you represent uh, and, and looked at homes, some over a million, some under a million. I'll just give a couple examples. In District A, uh, I think that's Director Meek's district, there's a home uh, under a million, $883,351 property value. Its taxable assessed value is 55,500, multiplying that by 6.37. The tax burden for this property for 5A alone is $354, much more than the 200 for this, this for a home less than a million dollars. If we normalize per $1 million increment of home value, this is $401. I'll just give another example uh, of a property over a million in dis District E, uh, I believe that's Director Williams District. There's a home, uh, $1,107,171. $1, the 5A cost is 449. Normalized to a million dollar of home value, that's $406. On average, I found $399 per million dollar increments of home value, again, just for 5A. Uh, again, to, I got 20 seconds. Um, you know, half of you were, were on the board when 5A and 5B were put on the ballot. Others of you campaigned uh, in support of 5A and 5B. Uh, so, Director Geiger, you were on the LRPC that made the case for 5A. So I cannot understand how any of you did not know what this would cost. My question is if you intentionally misled the public about the cost and how you plan to rectify this with taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. We will move remote for Holly M. Shall I? Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. That concludes public comment. We will take a 15 minute break. So 602, we will return back. Thanks.
back in session. Moving on to item number 10, the adoption of consent agenda. The recommendation is that we approve items 11 through 15. Do I have a motion concerning consent agenda? Moved. Move to approve. Yeah, sorry, move to approve. Second. Motion by Moore, second by Myers. Geiger? Aye. Meek? Aye. Moore? Aye. Myers? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed seven to zero. And then we will move <coughs> into the adoption of joint motion agenda approval minutes. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the minutes of the regular meeting from January 23rd, the special meeting of January 23rd, the special meeting of February 13th, and the regular meeting of February 13th as presented. Do I have a motion to approve all of the meetings listed? Move to adopt and approve. Motion by Geiger. Do second. I second. Second by Weiniger. Geiger? Aye. Meek? Aye. Moore? Abstain. Myers? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passes six to zero. All right, moving into item number 17, 2023 <gasps> Streamlined Limited Impact Process, or otherwise known as the SLIP Process, and School Capacity and Boundary Analysis, otherwise known as the SCUBA. Okay, I'm gonna have Chief Operating Officer Rich Cosgrove come up and introduce his speakers. Good evening, directors. As a follow-on to the enrollment projections presentation at the last board meeting, tonight's staff will be presenting urgent and longer-term school capacity boundary analysis issues that um, is really for your information at this point. And we will be coming back in April with a recommendation pending your approval. At this point, I would like to introduce our planning manager, Siobhan Caldwell, who will be giving the presentation. We also have Shannon Bingham from Western Demographics for any answers uh, to questions you may have after the presentation. Thank you. <coughs> I let you do the first slide, right? So I'm gonna pass it back off to Superintendent Aaron Kane to talk about this first slide. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so uh, as you all know, we are struggling with growth um, in our school voids and are having to make sure that we're assigning students to uh, as they move into places where we actually have the space for them. Um, the long-term solution, of course, is building neighborhood schools in these school voids. The temporary solution is our streamlined limited <coughs> impact process, which um, Siobhan and Shannon will be explaining to you. Um, the longer term solutions, I just wanna make sure that I continue to put options um, in front of our board and our public. Um, we can construct new schools in the school voids with taxpayer-approved bond funding, which of course requires um, a ballot initiative. We can construct new schools in the school voids, at least one perhaps, with COPs. The capacity for our COPs is very limited, and we would have to pay the payments, the lease payments for the COPs, out of um, our operational funds, which would mean significant cuts um, to both staffing and student programming in order to afford to pay those leases. We could issue RFPs for charter schools to construct schools um, in the school voids, or we can continue to add portable classrooms to overflow schools, which um, eventually means we have to reboundary existing neighborhoods. So to date, we try really hard to only change boundaries when it doesn't impact students that are already in our district. But if we continue to um, overcrowd and overflow the schools on the edges of um, our new communities, then we will have to look at reboundarying those neighborhoods so that we're sending students that live near those overflow schools to another school further away from them in order to accommodate all the traffic coming in from the new school. Um, this also requires additional busing 
and of course has a significant income impact on families. But those are our realistic options for dealing with growth in our school voids in our community. And with that, I'm going to have Shannon and Siobhan talk about the SLIP process. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. So I wanted to start with the timeline of what we're actually proposing for analysis and, analysis and implementation tonight um, that would be effective upon BOE approval as Rich stated later on in what we're targeting right now is late April. Um, so for January to February, that would be data collection and analysis. We've done a lot of that, um, tracking residential development filing status, what right of way, what transportation routes are going to be in place for these new developments, um, keeping track of private ownership versus builder and developer ownership. We're targeting those ones that are not in private ownership yet, those neighborhoods. Um, we are also developing our preliminary recommendations, so confirming which neighborhoods are eligible for the SLIP process um, and recommended all um, taking into account forecasted growth, available capacity, and efficient transportation routing in our recommendations that we'll be bringing back in April. Uh, internal vetting, that's what we're doing right now, making sure we're all on the same page with our leadership, cabinet, uh, the board, and our uh, board uh, committee. <clears throat> and then just ensuring that we've properly communi com communicated this to leadership and are being very transparent about our process. Uh, next month, we will be moving forward with vetting internally with staff and continual vetting with the, with the LRPC. Um, and then... Let's see. <clears throat> Drafting and finalizing our stakeholder uh, identification and outreach plan. This is for this type of process. It's typically developers, builders, prospective homeowners, school staff, and impart impacted uh, central admin staff, such as transportation, budget, those departments. Um, and then we will be completing our pending data analysis and any of those questions that come out of the vet, that vetting and finalizing our recommendations to do our outreach in April and come back for BOE consideration and then to do any follow-up outreach um, post BOE consideration and decision. So before I jumped into our recommend, jump into our recommendations, I just wanted to give a brief little history of SCUBA, what SCUBA and SLIP is. Um, so this was an initiative that was initiated in 2019 uh, with the development of an action plan, a district-wide survey um, that identified preferred capacity relief measures of our community. Um, and then we upda updated ideal program capacity for all 91 of our district operated schools at that time. Um, and we did a lot of internal polling, vetting, and work sessions with staff, the LRPC, and the Board of Education to review and prioritize all these different measures and scenarios. Um, so over the last few years, we have we adopted a, um, a SLIP process that stands for Streamline Limited Impact Process. Um, this is a much simpler, more streamlined, and overall quicker boundary change process uh, if for those changes that impact less than 10 DCSD households is proactively reassigning new development, addressing some kind of geograph geographic anomaly, and has consensus with our leadership and has a um, minimal to stable transportation impact. Um, so we, we used the slip process and did um, non-slip boundary changes and grade reassignments in, as you can see, those areas line up very nicely with the areas that are in our master capital plan and bond plan for new construction. Um, we've done pretty significant work to manage and balance enrollment in these areas. <clears throat> um, so an important note about this, I just wanted to state that at the time that we made the changes in um, Sage Canyon and Prairie Crossing. Uh, Stage, Sage Canyon was in a state of crisis, so you're gonna see another change recommended that impacts Sage Canyon. Um, we did boundary part of what is in Legacy Point now, which is the Macanta development into Legacy Point to provide some relief for Sage Canyon at that time. They were out of seats at that time and in crisis. Um, and then we are also just beginning to understand the kind of housing production and student generation we were going to see out of Sterling Ranch and Solstice. So just to give an idea of when all these systems were put in place, that's where we are. 
Um, and that's what we're coming back to. We've been able to pretty proactively manage uh, and balance enrollment in all of these areas with the SLIP process. So that's what we're continuing to do and ask for um, your sign on. on. <clears throat> And then here's where we are now um, in 2024-25 school year. We've done a thorough review of all the new residential development activity throughout the district, looking for slip up opportunities, those that uh, made sense and were feasible. We are bringing to you tonight for review. Um, and then we are also <clears throat> to recommend, we're recommending moving forward with the work needed to bring that back to you in April tonight. Um, and then just a note for those 2025 and beyond options, we're really looking at available tools in the toolbox, not, um, not hard recommendations tonight. So it's just a heads up FYI. <clears throat> Um, so this is just an overview of what we're recommending for Coyote Creek and Legacy Point are the areas where we are recommending immediate slip intervention. So that would be effective upon BOE approval with the primary you know, goal of cap capturing enrollment uh, next year. So at Coyote Creek, we have 24 seats available next year with two mobiles on site. Uh, will be 60 seats short in two years and 200 seats short in five years um, is the current state there. At Legacy Point, we're about 100 seats short next year with the current number of mobiles on site and 300 seats short in, in five years. So those are the areas that have new residential development in them that we're recommending looking at this year and implementing something for um, the 24-25 school year. Um, these schools below, these are in our other facility void areas, Eagle Ridge, Buffalo Ridge, Timber Trail, and Douglas County High School Elementary School, <clears throat> Ele feeder elementary schools. Um, according to our current forecast, they do have the seats available in the five-year outlook, but um, these are often slow moving. Uh, tools. So should we not be successful in bond or constructing new elementary schools? These are things to think about that need to be happening during that time. <clears throat> kind of a contingency planning. <clears throat> this is a map of our, our school void. Um, this What you're looking at here is att elementary attendance boundaries that are categorized and classified off of the available neighborhood school capacity. So based on our enrollment projections for five years out and the current, uh, what we have for the, the facilities ideal program capacity. So the red areas are those areas that are over 129% of their ideal facility capacity. Um, you can see the, the legend there, but basically blue areas, we have more capacity, red areas, we are out of capacity in the facility. <coughs> So we have some major school voids, um, and I think it's worth noting that the, the voids that we are looking at, they're more typical um, from speaking with Shannon and his experience working with other school districts. This is kind of what you see in a rural school district environment, um, which is totally fine and acceptable, but this is not, not used to what folks are seeing in a suburban environment to have to drive this far to their nearest neighborhood school. <clears throat> um, so there's the bridge gate, and these are all in the north planning area. Oops. The canyons is what you're seeing there, um, and Sterling Ranch Solstice. And these are all really large developments, 8,000 units for Ridge Gate East, 13K for Sterling Ranch, and then about 5,000 units for the canyons. So these are large areas that are um, currently developing out. So for uh, Coyote Creek, the current state, we are forecasting continual growth over the next five years. Two of the four mobile pads are currently occupied. occupied. Um, portable classrooms can provide the needed seats that we're forecasting until 26, the 26-27 school year, where you'll have 14 available seats with all mobile pads occupied and the facility is projected to be at 143%. So here's the, the slip opportunity, what, we're, what we are looking at right now and giving an FYI and asking um, for support to continue, continue analyzing 
is the reassignment of those Sterling Ranch filings. You'll see them outlined in black. Those that are still in the Coyote Creek attendance areas and labeled, um, we are looking at reassigning to Trailblazer. Um, so we did some of this last year. Those purple areas were what was approved last year, and these are just additional filings coming in. They have no homes in them. Some of them are only have preliminary approval, but it's about 2,000 housing units total between all of these. Um, so there, I'll let you read the slide. There's just there's opportunities and there's risks in the in the slip process. Um, just stating them there for everybody to see. And then for 2025 and beyond, um, Eagle Ridge portable classrooms can accommodate the forecasted enrollment in the five-year outlook. Um, should new construction not be um, achievable here, the alternative that we would want to start looking at probably next year would be um, boundary reassignment of existing households. So not for implementation next year, but start analyzing and determining um, what's feasible and what's not. <clears throat> Same for Buffalo Ridge. Uh, portable classrooms can accommodate the forecasted enrollment and capacity in the next five years. Um, this one, though, you're you're really reaching the end of your ability to do that at the end of the five-year outlook. So this one is on our radar. It's another facility void that should we not be able to provide new construction, we want to be prepared for when portable classrooms are not an option in the 2028-29 school year and beyond. Um, moving on to our east planning area. Um, this is another one of our facility voids that's in the master capital plan. Uh, we have a lot of growth and development that's just starting to occur on the Crowfoot Valley Corridor, uh, Looking Glass Housing and Tantera Housing. They've been, those developers have been able to really pivot and be quick on their feet and provide some more dense, very affordable for the region housing. So we're seeing some significant growth there that um, we want to address as quickly as possible. Um, so here's the current state. Uh, we're projecting continual growth over the next five years. One of the three mobile pads are occupied at Legacy Point. Um, and we are projecting that portable classrooms will be able to accommodate this until the 25-26 school year um, is when we no longer have that option. Um, so this is a map of the two. There will be two areas that we're looking at. This is my, my oops, sorry, I always do that. Uh, this is Macanta or South Canyons, as its name, uh, as the county calls it. There's about 5,500 housing units that are not under private ownership yet. Um, oh, that's 5,500 housing units for all three of these areas. Sorry, that are not under private ownership yet. We won't be seeing some of these homes for about another two years. Um, so we have ample opportunity to uh, address this and kind of put these homes where it makes the most sense in which attendance area. Again, there's opportunity and risk. You're taking um, advantage of existing capacity in nearby schools, um, but you know, you know this always presents the risk of, a trans of less efficient transportation routing. It's not typically immediate relief. Um, these, this is a long acting solution. Um, and this, this is also a cross feeder change. So we'll have to look at what this change could potentially do to forecasted enrollment at the middle school and high school level. <clears throat> and then this is just to state that um, 2025 and beyond, should we not see the relief that we're um, expecting from, from the slip change, we would be looking at re, um, reboundering existing households. Um, and I'm just gonna fly through these because I'm running out of time. Uh, in the West Planning area, this is another map of the voids. We have a large facility void down in South Castle Rock, not, no school that exists south of Southridge, although we have pretty significant growth um, in Castle Rock, much south of that. And then Daw Dawson Ridge um, will be coming online hopefully soon. <laughs> we, we're watching that developer, but we don't know what it's going to do yet. Um, and then this is just to state again for the West Planning area that should we not um, get new construction there to address our, our needs that we would want to look at reconfiguration of sixth grade at Mesa Middle School and reboundering existing homes potentially. 
And then that's it. Next steps is that we would like to bring this back for consideration at the April 23rd, 2024 meeting. And I will open it up to questions with that. Thank you. Yeah. I knew Director Geiger would be first up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, first of all, in the slip process, <coughs> are our projections on Coyote Creek, those take into account the prior slip process where we moved neighborhoods to Trailblazer last year? Okay. And what is, have those houses that we assigned to Trailblazer last year begun to be developed? Or we don't know the adoption process, the adoption percentage there yet? Uh, very slowly. So um, right now, student yield and house production in Sterling Ranch is um, a, a little bit weak, uh, as opposed to some other areas that have been more quick on their feet, as Siobhan alluded to, where they have gone to more dense housing, more affordable housing that has been more appealing to young families. So we haven't really seen um, you know, even though we were very proactive and we acted before, we had more than, I think, six people that moved into those homes, but um, they're just not moving like a house on fire right now. So it's, it's a, more of a steady um, kind of an absorption. And a lot of those homes, I think, are still in the hands of the builder. So um, we're just not seeing that kind of super rapid movement in Sterling Ranch like we are in other places where there's more affordable housing. Um, and this is a question more for the superintendent. I don't need an answer today. This was something that somebody brought up to me by email. Can we issue a certificate of participation and then pay it off with a later bond? Thank you for that question. Um, my guess would be no, but I do not know that for sure. So we will get back to you with that answer. Yeah, somebody just, it would be, a mortgage with a hope of winning the lottery later, and I'm not sure I'm in favor of that process, but it was a question that was asked, and I would like to know more about it. Um, I did, last thing I wanted to say is that um, we met with, LR, with our committees this week, and one of the things that LRPC had a question about, concern about is whether or not they're being listened to. Just want to point out, I was at LRPC last meeting. I'll be their liaison from now on. I know that they're very involved in this process and listening very much, but I want to point it out to everyone else that this is a very, cl the collaboration between the planning department and our contractor and the Long Range Planning Committee is I think one of our greatest examples of how our community groups work. And I'm just gonna kind of consider continue to point that out in every area where I know that our board committees have taken great work to do it, even though it's being presented by staff who do the majority of the work. I also want to make sure that LRPC gets their credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just a question about how you inform families that this will impact. Sure. So um, we always aim for zero impact to existing DCSD households, but if, if there's, you know, a filing that would provide great capacity relief and there's two families in there, we personal contact. So ha go through the principal to set up a meeting remote or in person or over the phone to explain everything to them. Um, we also visit sales offices. So the developers and the builders that are impacted, we try to provide all materials, as many materials as we can for prospective homeowners and their staff. So we do in-person visits to sales offices and then a town hall type meeting for de impacted developers and builders. Um, I think we've typically had two of those. We had very low attendance last year. Um, and then uh, certified mail and email notification for, for everybody on, on, on pretty much every step of the way. So we typically notify beforehand during like, this is what we're considering. It's under consideration. It's been decided upon by the, the BOE. Um, and then prospective homeowners was the last one that I met. So if you're, you know, we're in a, we're proposing to reassign a filing that doesn't have anybody living there yet, but lots are under private ownership, we will contact them via certified and email, certified mail and email as much as we can. Anyone else? Famous, Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Moving on to Thank item 18, you. growth and decline follow-up with timeline and north planning area planning team. Uh, 
Okay, um, you have Assistant Superintendent Windsor and myself to talk about um, growth and decline follow-up. Um, I wanna start by thanking all of you for the retreat and for um, the high-level discussions about um, board ends and what that might mean for growth and decline. That's extremely helpful. Um, as always, we start with a commitment to our students, um, making sure that we have excellent schools that are a point of pride for our community, uh, making sure that our schools, all of our schools are able to offer the great opportunities to students, um, making sure we have college and career and service pathways and being a destination district. Um, in terms of planning for the future and addressing growth and decline, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. I wanna give you an overview of the challenges and then uh, Mr. Windsor will take over with kind of what we've done and um, where we're moving into. So as the board knows, our district is 844 square miles and we just um, spoke about this and having significant school voids. Um, we have our school void areas where we have traditionally provided neighborhood elementary schools in major geographic regions. Um, today we're busing students from those school deserts into overflow schools in other regions. Um, we also have areas of our district that are greatly declining. Um, Highlands Ranch in particular, you may remember the birth rate curve for Highlands Ranch went really far up and then just absolutely plummeted. So we have 18 elementary schools um, in Highlands Ranch and many of them are getting smaller and smaller, which is, means that our students are losing out on opportunities. And in fact, I was thinking of that tonight just as we were talking um, to the amazing STEAM teacher from Pioneer Elementary, because at Pioneer Elementary, they are a thriving elementary school in terms of their size, and they are able to offer art, music, PE, and um, STEAM to all of their kids. Um, I interviewed a principal candidate recently um, discussing a school in Highlands Ranch, and we talked about how they are only able to provide music and PE. Um, they found a way to be able to let the kids have a little bit of art once per week, um, but they really aren't able to offer art even as a special because um, of the challenges that come with being an incredibly small school. So for us, this is all about opportunities for our students. And again, you just saw the school void, so I'll just show it to you one more time that Highlands Ranch in particular is book ended by growth, so massive growth on either side, but in the middle, you can see that capacity is continuing to decrease. Um, and so it is our goal to develop a proactive three to five year plan with significant input um, that addresses building elementary schools in our deserts and how we make sure that we have thriving schools in our areas of decline. Um, and so that's gonna be really important. So we have talked about the future pairing of elementary schools um, by 2026. Again, all about opportunities for students so that every student has access to a thriving school and all of the opportunities that come with having access to a thriving school. We have made the commitment that um, no staff members would lose their jobs as a result of school pairings. And truly, we expect most of the staff to come together in, in that pairing process. And we certainly have plenty of job openings across our district, so we are able to make that commitment. Um, and of course, our district has plenty of uses for um, elementary school buildings. I just recently had COO Crossgrove give me a complete list of all the space that we are leasing um, across our school district. And I would we would very much like to not be leasing space because that would save our district significant money. Um, and so a, an elementary school gives us the opportunity to not be leasing space and to provide space for special education programming or homeschool support, um, professional development, many, many different options for um, an elementary school space. So I don't want our community to be worried about a boarded up elementary school somewhere um, in the community. So we have lots and lots of uses um, for our buildings that will save our district operational resources and again, allow our students to thrive in thriving schools. With that, I'm going to hand it to over to Mr. Windsor to talk about the process that they have been following. 
Thank you, Superintendent Kane, and thank you, Board of Education, for um, having the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, we've informally on and off been having this conversation just with you probably close to about a, a, over a year. Um, but the idea of actually pulling together a North Planning Area and Enrollment Advisory Team is something that um, is one I'm incredibly thankful for the opportunity to formally engage in this work. Um, as a sitting principal in this district at Sagewood Middle School, I was having this conversation in my last few years as sitting principal over the last seven, eight years. We've had this conversation on and off. And I know some of my colleagues who are sitting in the same bus barn room having that conversation many years back as well too. And so um, thank you very much for again, just getting engaged in this conversation. Um, I do wanna kick this off. And this was a conversation we began with our North Planning Area team is in this decision and this journey we're about to embark on, there really isn't a net zero decision. And what I mean by that is meaning that not making a decision has an impact. Making a decision has an impact. And by not making a decision is eventually gonna compromise the educational programming for a number of students. And so for us, turning a blind, blind eye to this is something that absolutely has a ripple impact, I think across our system, understanding that those dollars have to come from somewhere to be able to offset our small school factor that we offer within our schools. And so we really wanted to make sure as we engaged in this work that it was extremely collaborative process and really was tied to some really clear purpose in the sense of what we were trying to engage in. So our North Planning area um, en enrollment team really is broken into two teams. There's an operations team and there's a community engagement team. And really what our hope is, is to make sure it's a collaborative process. Oops, I'll have you. Nope, no worries. Nope, a collaborative process in which we are developing, again, a three to five year plan, um, which we really are making sure our community truly understands the challenges that are in front of us. We also know that we want to make sure we're providing consistent and timely information with our stakeholders about the enrollment challenges. There are a lot of different variations that we've heard um, where you'll see schools will say, you know, there's a Save My School group you'll see on social media. Our hope is to make sure that people have the information in a timely manner, know where to look for information. So there's not going to be narratives that are made up. They have the clear information. So we want to commit ourselves to that. We also want to make sure that as we engage in this process, this isn't just about enrollment. We really want to make sure that this is understanding the multiple criteria that are involved in this particular process when we're talking about potentially pairing schools and how do we get defined feedback. Um, I've been holding on to this for a while. Director Meek, you may be familiar with this document here just around providing focus feedback. It's something you shared with us um, quite a few months ago about making sure when we talk about feedback, it's really important that we make sure we're defining what clear feedback we're looking for, not just saying it in general. But really, are we asking for feedback and doing something with it? Is it about sharing information and then tweaking information? We want to be very deliberate in that process. And so as we develop our operations and community engagement team, when we go to our community, we want to make sure we're very clear about what type of feedback we're looking for in this process. We also want to make sure that we're identifying key stakeholder groups in this process. Obviously, we've talked with our um, sitting principals for our elementary and middle schools. We also want to make sure we're talking with staff. We want to talk with Highlands Ranch Metro area. We're talking with realtors, businesses, law enforcement, um, our federation, all those different areas that we want to engage in that conversation, bishops, churches that are in the community. There are a variety of stakeholder groups. Part of that community engagement plan is defining who do we need to speak to in this process. Process. And so we have a very collaborative group that are defining that work. We also want to make sure that any decision we make is grounded really in that second to last bullet that's on there is about doing what's best for students. That is the guide of everything we're doing. We've spent a significant amount of time about making sure that is the anchor of what we're doing. We also need to make sure as we're engaged in this work, which we've done a ton of research around the national level as well as the local level, we also need to make sure there's board policy to help set some structure to this. And so we're gonna be working hand in hand about having some structure about developing board policy that helps us address growth and decline and pairings in the future as well. So who's on the team? Um, here's a visual for you to be able to see who's on our operations sides of the house, as well as who's on the community engagement side of the house. And we really wanted to try to get as many diverse folks on this group without the team getting too big, where sometimes when you get a team that's too large, you don't get anything accomplished, you talk a lot, but don't do things. Our hope was to make sure we had a representative group that um, was a, a good sized group that was representative, and that ranged from folks from human resources to budget to transportation 
to sitting principals in the areas, to our choice programming directors, early childhood, um, language, um, language culture and equity, our advanced academics group, um, a variety of folks, our boards and board committees from our DAC group to LRPC, a variety of folks, we wanted to be a part of this active conversation. So as we're engaging this work, people's voices are at the tables. We also know that we're gonna continue to meet with board groups throughout, as well as different engagement groups um, with multiple stakeholders. And so for us, we've been on this kind of this timeline here um, so far. So we first had a chance to meet as an entire team, which included our operations and community engagement team starting in December, to really outline about what was the foundation of this particular work, what were gonna be our norms of collaboration, knowing that these are not easy conversation. We need to talk about process, not people, but understand what's best for our students, to really establish a high-functioning working group We've had a chance to meet as an operation team once, um, as well as a community engagement team once. We're gonna be meeting this Friday again for the second time. And these groups are really, are really tied into developing an operations plan and a community engagement plan, making sure that this is not being done in isolation, but this is being done by the representative group, giving active feedback within this group, but also soliciting input from uh, multiple stakeholder groups. And so this gives you just a little bit of a vantage point um, of um, at least the structure of our meeting structures, knowing that we're still meeting in between and doing the work. So what does this look like from a draft engagement timeline standpoint? And so I really want to walk back to even last year where we began some of this work to really map this out. So to give you kind of a conceptual overview is last spring we had an opportunity, myself, uh, Superintendent Kane, had a chance to meet with all of our elementary middle school principals in the North Planning area. Actually we met with all the North Planning area principals to begin with to talk about the draft timeline sequence um, and kind of our process of what this was going to look like. We also wanted to make sure we all firmly understood the challenges and opportunities that were in front of us. Um, and again, that timeline sequence. We also then wanted to make sure principals have the opportunity to speak with their staff, the impacted staff in those elementary and middle schools to define what the challenges were and what the timeline sequence was. And those principals also had a chance to either speak to the SAC or the SAC chair about this same challenge and opportunity as well. We also created a survey um, for folks to give us feedback on the timeline sequence. I'll share with you later about their feedback of did they agree, disagree with the timeline sequence of how we were gonna engage in this particular work. And so really what our hope was is to make sure people understood the timeline, the sequence, the challenges that we were facing. We also wanted to meet hand in hand with our LRPC, which this has been a conversation, that same conversation we talked about middle school programming with Director Geiger many, many years ago from an LRP, LRPC perspective, but also had a chance to speak with FOC about some of these challenges last year as well. And so we really wanted to start gathering what was the formulation last spring going into this year? What was that form formulation of what a North Planning Area team would look like? Who would be a part of that group? So we solicited input from a variety of folks about who should sit on that particular team. We also then want to start mapping out regular meeting structures that people put on their calendar. I can tell you when I sent a calendar invite, I was getting acceptances for 2,025 meetings. Like we've gone that far out to make sure people understand this is going to be a, a long-term commitment you are making when you are sitting on this. This isn't just going to be a quick decision and move on. And so we've really mapped that piece out. We really wanted to make sure this was collaborative um, and we really wanted to make sure we could begin identifying our next steps. So this fall, we had a chance to develop the North Planning Area team, begin scheduling up particular meetings, and we had a chance to be able to share that information about our structural approach um, in January, about what we were going to be tackling from a North Planning Area team. But really, we want to start mapping out really three rounds of engagement, formal rounds of engagement we're looking at. Our hope is to be able to identify key stakeholder groups, make sure we have a website or an area that folks people know where to go to to be able to grab the information. But really in round one, we wanted to make sure that people understood what the challenges that were in front of us as a particular district and really what our process is gonna to be to solicit input. So we'll have that being round one of engagement. We're also gonna have a second round of engagement where we'll start identifying criteria that we're gonna be evaluating as well as getting soliciting feedback on those criteria about how that would support us when we're talking about pairing schools in the future. And then the last round of engagement will really be around taking that criteria, developing solutions and getting feedback on that solution. We provide that to those different stakeholder groups. And so we really wanted to make sure as we go through this engagement process, we've developed mechanisms and feedback to get regular um, feedback from them during those engagement sessions as well, which then obviously we would be providing updates to our Board of Education um, throughout that process. And so we really wanted to make sure we were structurally navigating this, understanding that the North Planning area 
is not the only area that potentially we could be affecting long term, whether it's West Planning Area, East Planning Area, that we have a good structure and foundation as we move forward. So um, really, as we start getting into the spring um, and summer of this year, we're really going to be looking at doing round one of engagement, planning out round two of engagement as well. We really are going to continue to get updates and working with our cabinet, different departments as well, and different community groups to gather feedback. But we really want to make sure we're revising those operations and community engagement plans, all tied to our value statements. The work that you're doing around your board ends hugely helps us in this process to really ground ourselves in what we believe in and the student experience that we we want to be able to provide for our students. So as we head into next fall, um, there's a, quite a bit of information on here, and it really is going to be about making sure we start that round two process, so start identifying some of the criteria um, about that we're going to be evaluating when we're pairing schools, and we're going to continue to revise those plans, but gather focused feedback, and, and I think that defined feedback is really going to be important in this process so our community understands. When we ask them for feedback, they know the, how that's going to impact the decisions and the considerations as we move forward. Um, as we move into the winter and spring, obviously we're going to continue to provide updates to you around round two of engagement. Um, um, we're going to be obviously doing this hand in hand in the, as we look at the end of this year and going into beginning of next year, the development of board policy. Um, there's some great model policies from CASB um, as well as our neighboring school districts around policies specifically for this, which we have spent a lot of time researching and so we'll be working on developing that. Um, we'll also then be focusing on developing round three of engagement as well around those potential solutions. What our goal is, is we want to make sure the North Planning Area team has a chance to make a recommendation to our cabinet. Our cabinet can make a recommendation to our Board of Education. But really what we want to make sure is we have created very focused means to gather feedback in this particular process as well. Which then leads us um, kind of into this next process. And sorry, I meant to go to the last bullet. When we make that recommendation to the Board of Education, obviously you'll be getting regular information. And so by the spring, what our hope is of 2024, 2025, so from a year from now, our hope is to be able to have a recommendation moving forward about what that looks like for us in pairing schools. Um, but again, it's been a very collaborative process over the last 12 to 15 months as we engage through this. And so what our hope is, is it will give us an on-ramp for us to make sure that we are um, having an opportunity to, to engage with potentially schools that are being paired. And I think the biggest thing that we want to make sure we highlight in this is that last bullet on the left-hand side is we really want to make sure we're doing this hand-in-hand -hand with our schools. We know there's potentially going to be additional one-time staffing that we want to make sure our, our, our teachers have the resources they need with human resources. Our families have resources from counselors because a transition is a transition and it's something that a school community means a lot um, to our students. And so we want to make sure we have the right resources in hand that nobody feels left out in this process and that we build multiple events to make sure that um, the schools feel like they've developed their new community as well, but really have a focused means of doing this. And so we will provide multiple engagement opportunities for those paired schools. We'll work with human resources to make sure everybody is taken care of from a job perspective. We'll continue to work with different departments to make any of those transitions. But again, we want to work hand in hand with folks in those particular processes. And so that's a lot of information. We wanted to make sure as you um, had a chance to see this timeline, we also then solicited this conceptual timeline for all of our schools, the school leaders, um, this, the staff in the community and the SACs to give us feedback on the timeline sequence. The feedback that we receive is 89% of those, which was over 100 responses, gave us favorable feedback on the timeline. The 11% that said we didn't appreciate it was saying, please speed this up. It actually wasn't go as slow. And so that was the majority of the feedback that we received. And so I'll turn it over to Superintendent Kane to provide any further details and I can go back to any slides as well. Really, I was just going to say that we are happy to take your questions. Um, I think some of the next steps that we had spoken about um, at the retreat is as you all are looking at your um, draft board ends, the, the staff will bring forward um, a potential interpretation of those draft ends. And you know, one of the words that we're really focusing on in your draft ends is that thriving word um, and accessible. So we wanna make sure that each and every student in our district has access to the amazing opportunities that we're providing as a district. We're actually doing a great job in that regard 
at the high school level. You've seen our um, career and technical education access. You've seen it broken down by subgroup. We have really great access. Um, Mr. Windsor was just telling me today that we have 2,200 students in our district that are accessing a career and technical education program in a high school other than their own high school. So thanks to the alignment of our schedules, um, we have 2,200 students that are accessing career and technical education programs outside of their high school across our district. We want to make sure that, that same, um, oper those same opportunities are available to each and every one of our students regardless of what neighborhood elementary school um, they are assigned to and they go to. So this is really a continuation of that work as well, that accessible opportunities and thriving schools. So I do want to give a quick little thank you. So I have some of our North Planning Area team that, that came here tonight to just really show that level of commitment. I can tell you this team, and um, if John Gutierrez here is, I would really give him a hard time about this because he loves adding meetings. But one of the things that I will say in particular is even when this team met, they actually asked for more time for us to even to be able to meet. Um, just knowing that the importance of this work was as, was something they made a firm commitment to. And so I want to say thank you to Gordon, Katie, Colleen, Remy, Natasha, Ian. Now, Rich, your team has been a part of it. Siobhan, Shannon. Um, we've had a variety of folks. Stacy, um, thank you. Allison, for thank you for being a part of this particular group. But it's been a team effort for us to engage. And so one thing that we've seen other school districts struggle with is we have a folks, five or six folks that sit in a room, do this work, make decisions about this work, and nobody else knows about it. What our hope is to make sure that we utilize the expertise that's sitting in a room of representing all the stakeholders within our community to make sure their voice is being heard. So when we make decisions, we're not making decisions without people, but we're doing it hand in hand with people. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, Director Thompson. Thank you, and thank you all for serving on this committee and doing this work. Um, so I just have a couple questions around uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, I know that you mentioned that um, round one started in fall and it's in the spring, um, and that you guys are in the process of identifying key stakeholders and developing that plan. Uh, which key stakeholders have you guys identified so far? So I appreciate you asking the question. There are some that we've identified um, very quickly. I think one of the parts of the community engagement plan was actually to make sure our team was actually going through making sure our entire list was as comprehensive as it needed to be. So we've identified natural folks from our staff, our principals, our students, our families, you know, Highlands Ranch Metro Districts, our realtors, our churches, um, um, our industry partners. We obviously want to work with our elected officials in this particular process, our chambers, et cetera. But the list is a lot more exhaustive than that process as well. And so what we wanted to make sure is when we were identifying this plan is that we are exhausted and exhaustive in our, exhausted and exhaustive, um, I think, in our in our plan to make sure we don't miss anybody. And so, you know, groups that we, we want to make, you know, representations of, we have a few folks that aren't here tonight, but we will make sure that those groups are being identified. So when we do go out in that process round one that we haven't missed those key stakeholder groups. That's a part of our um, community engagement plan. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that there are, um, we have been discussing this for about a year already with our community. So um, thanks to uh, Assistant Superintendent Windsor and his team, all of the um, school accountability committees across Highlands Ranch have been engaged, um, along with, of course, the staff and the leaders. Um, I've talked to the Highlands Ranch Metro, Metro District, um, the Highlands Ranch Community Association, um, elected officials in Highlands Ranch. So we've definitely really kind of begun um, that engagement process. Um, I've had conversations with Sarah Mesmer from the Douglas County Federation, um, lots and lots of different stakeholders. So the group will continue and go and re-engage um, all of those um, parties, but we just want to make sure we're involving as many stakeholders as we possibly can. So um, certainly if there are any suggestions from um, our public that are listening tonight or the Board of Education, as far as um, groups to engage, please send an email to Assistant Superintendent Windsor. Um, so I'm glad that we've engaged Douglas County Federation. Um, I, that was going to be my follow-up question, is if they have been identified as one of the stakeholders yes. that we're seeking feedback from. And then um, 
I, the, the other question I have is just kind of more of a technical question. So when we're seeking out feedback and doing surveys, are you are we doing something similar that was done with like the MLO and bond where we're providing information and education around the topic first? Yes. So we know that the feedback we're getting is well informed. You are spot on. And that was a big part of making sure that was kind of that two part component of not only just sharing timeline, but understanding the challenges that we do have in front of us um, was a big part in the, in the layered impact that it does have on the system. So absolutely, yes. And then it's also soliciting feedback because I'm not sure we would probably get really good focus feedback if we didn't identify it up front. So you're spot on. Yeah, and I would just uh, also add to that that framing the problem has been our priority. Yeah. Um, we have to have kind of general consensus across the community that this is indeed a challenge and an understanding of the impact of ignoring it and no decision. Um, having spoken to some of our school leaders in Highlands Ranch, um, I feel like they are saying their staff understand, are, are really understanding the problem. And in fact, I just talked to someone today who um, actually said she's really looking forward to this process playing out because they can so clearly see in their schools how students are not getting opportunities. And all of our leaders, our teachers, we all want to see our students get those great opportunities. Director Weiniger. I just want to say thank you um, for uh, putting in all this work toward this. This is really important. And um, thank you for putting out a timeline. So yes. we all have a visual of what to expect. And the website looks great. Um, it's good to have a place to direct people to go. And um, looking forward to hear more feedback and engagement as Great. time goes on. Thank you very much. Director Geiger. Thank you very much. Um, very glad, knowing most of the people on this committee, I know that uh, there's a great deal of work that has been done and even more that will be done. I do have a few questions. I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned DC, Douglas County Federation. I want, wonder if you might talk to me about why there was a decision not to have a teacher on either one of the teams. So really a couple of different things. I think as we're talking about engagement sessions, I think teachers very much have a direct connection with each of our principals, which will be an active part of that process. What our hope is, is not to try to pull teachers out of our classroom during our meetings during the days, but really what our hope is, is for this team to be able to do the work, but really to make sure we're spending time with our leaders to have that direct contact with their individual teachers, knowing that as a former principal, mm -hmm. that direct conversation I could have with each of my teachers had a different slant to that conversation. And really a big part of this, how do we make sure that we had a principal voice on there that was also representing our teachers in that particular process? But really it's about spending that regular time with our key stakeholder groups, which will very much include our teachers in that process um, as well. But we also wanted to make sure we had that conduit that was immediate to our teachers with their leaders to have that key information. Do you want to add anything? No, only thank you for raising that. Do you anticipate specific outreach targeted towards teachers, a absolutely. public meeting or that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Wonderful. Um, I guess I, I'm trying to figure out philosophically where, we, where the board comes into this. Um, this describes very much an administrative process. One of the things and I don't have a position on this yet, so please don't take my questions as anything but no, that. Understood. One of the key issues to me will be what criteria do we use? Yeah. Which schools get combined? I can take it. Um, and I, don't, I know we're not at that point yet. I know we're a good ways away from that point. Mm -hmm. But I want to know from an administrative point of view, do you believe that developing the criteria is an administration job or is that something that the administration recommends and then comes to the board for approval? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So actually, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. What is the Board of Education's involvement? Um, as we've discussed in the past, it's really important that this is something that, that we do hand in hand. Um, staff has no interest in going off in a direction that is not what the board wants. So um, let me sort of go through it. One. We will be coming to you with a proposed um, interpretation of the ends, particularly as it relates to growth and decline. Because if we're all in agreement that thriving schools are what are best for kids, PK through five, et cetera, 
um, then, then that helps direct staff on which direction to go. Two, the board will have a lot of involvement in the, at the policy level. Um, so we will be coming to you with recommendations for policies um, in this regard and, and we'll make recommendations and then we, we will discuss. Um, and ultimately it will be up to all of you to decide if you're gonna uh, adopt a policy. Three, um, on the criteria, the criteria is something that we would collaboratively work with the North Area Planning Team and our community to come up with, get feedback on that criteria um, and look at that criteria and ultimately the criteria would be brought to the Board of Education um, for your um, approval because I, I, it really is important that we walk um, along this walk together. So it certainly doesn't go from today to we come forward with pairing dis recommendations. Um, you know, we will have the Board of Education involved every step of the way. I hope that helps kind of lay out um, the board's role in, in this because this is something that really is in the board's lane. Okay. Can I ask a couple more? Could we look at uh, slide 16, please? This is kind of the upcoming engagement and process. I am reading that the next kind of board involvement starts sometimes next fall or even next winter, uh, DCSD, Board of Education, update, et cetera. Would you anticipate it was around that time period that we would discuss criteria? Yeah. So actually on, on slide 15, on my own notes, um, actually is a, is a, there's a bullet underneath actually around talking about board policy. So as we start talking about the creation of this particular work, we'll be looking at this spring going into next fall okay. for us to be able to really start engaging in looking at that particular process. And so we really wanted to make sure as we started kicking off this work, it's actually part of our operations plan in particular is actually identified board engagement policy, what does that look like? And so what we wanted to make sure we were doing was our stakeholder group one was aware of what that hand in hand process looked like. So what we don't wanna do is that just be owned by a couple of folks. We wanna make sure our team were mightily aware of that particular process, knowing that we needed to get a couple meetings underneath our belt, just to really establish what our focus, what we were grounding ourselves in then have an opportunity for us to be able to start creating some of the structures that Superintendent Kane talked about to then bring before you, knowing that it's gonna be an iterative process that's gonna take us into probably this spring going into summer and fall as well. Yeah, policies first, right? So um, that's kind of what Assistant Superintendent Windsor is talking about is the, the policy realm. Um, the criteria comes later yeah. um, because once, once you approve criteria, Right, it's, it's, if it's really objective criteria, it's not that far from criteria to recommendations. So criteria comes um, later. That's more like um, the winter and spring following as, as Assistant Superintendent Windsor said. Yep. Is it of value to you, and this is truly a question, to have members of the board at public outreach? Um, I can respond to that. Um, so when when I did um, public, we did public outreach around the bond and MLO, um, board members often accompanied us for public outreach, not necessarily to present, although this time I would love to get into that pattern on our bond, um, but just to be there to hear feedback, et cetera. So depending on the nature of the outreach, there is a role for that community engagement piece because um, you know, as we talked about at retreat, that's one of the three roles of the Board of Education. So um, we will make efforts to make sure that um, the Board of Education is included in community outreach um, where, it, where it's appropriate. Yep. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I, again, I know the people on this committee. I greatly appreciate. There are few things we do that are more emotional or more challenging. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have heard from other districts about their challenges. I have seen other districts that, in my opinion, haven't done appropriate outreach to make this work. So thank you for all of your plans and for all you do. We will continue to appreciate you. 
Thank you. Director Myers. Well, I definitely think these are difficult conversations that we're having, and I, we talked about this starting a long time ago, and I think we can almost predict emails tonight with fear that we're going to be shutting down schools. So, the, of course, our key is going to be communicating with the public and making sure that we stay on top of what we're doing. And I know as one of the teachers of those specials or those ones that we think are so important and they're the first classes to go and some of the kids and we know most of the kids thrive on the arts and the music and and we need to keep that available for all of our students so thank you and hopefully we can really keep our community involved and communicated too well so that they can understand that we're really trying to go really forward with getting a comprehensive plan to get this taken care of. Yeah, we know, we know there's an emotionality to this work. This is not something that any one of us um, would have any choice that we'd love to do this. This becomes about a community and kids, and that is something, as we have heard from numerous occasions from Superintendent Kane, that this is grounded in what's doing best for our kids, and these are the hardest decisions that we are going to have to make, and is something that I can assure you keeps each and every one of us up at night thinking about as well. So this is not something a cerebral-based decision. This is very much coming from the heart as well. And so just want to reiterate that same point. Thank you, Director Myers. Director Meek. So a big thank you to the team. I know it's, it's a ton of work and it's only starting, right? Yep. Um, I had a few questions, some along the lines with Director Geiger and you know our role with community engagement. And I know Director Geiger and I are probably the two directors who have, who are from and representing those regions. So. <laughs> I think being um, involved in listening in those engagement opportunities is really, really helpful. I also know we're bringing our community connections plan, which is our board plan to connect and do engagement. And maybe in March, we can look at some of the key questions that we're asking mm -hmm. in that plan to see if maybe there are tweaks that we should make. So I know that's coming up on our March agenda. Um, Question I had on the survey feedback. I think I heard you say just over 100 um, staff and SACs. So 120 responses from a mixture from principals, teachers, staff, and SAC members were typically is what we were getting feedback on. So yes, 120 or 121. I can't remember the exa exact number, one of the two. And so did the SAC members work through their principals to respond to the survey? I just, I don't remember anything coming through DAC, okay. but I may have missed that. It, it did not. We went through principals with their okay. individual SACs to have those conversations, so. All right. And I, I just know DAC is usually central in that communication yep. between, um, well, DAC and the SAC. So I'm just curious, have you thought about how and when the DAC comes yeah. into the picture. Um, this has definitely been questions yeah. we'll receive very frequently and we haven't had answers. So I think we'll have questions from the DAC next time yeah. we go back. That's a hugely important group. Obviously we wanted to get to the most immediate and local level I think with our SACs and our principals knowing that um, as the principal, you're going to be getting those conversations on a regular basis, knowing that, to be quite honest with you, those conversations didn't start this past year. They've been going on for, countless years to be quite honest with you. And so what we've been able to just trying to do is making sure that as a collective team, we had a firm understanding of what our challenges were and our timeline. So we had an opportunity, we went to DAC. Obviously we wanted to get that feedback, focus feedback that we were looking for with DAC. DAC is gonna be a huge, um, is gonna be a, a very important group for us to continue to um, engage with as well as you know, our students and our SAC groups and a variety of folks to make sure they're receiving that information. As a matter of fact, Superintendent Kane this past week just had a conversation a little bit with just our SAC around bond work and other things and really trying to engage our students in this piece. And so we know our DAC, our SAC students, our SACs, multiple stakeholder groups, but I, I can assure you having a DAC member sitting on this um, on this particular team, she is very invested to make sure that's a part of the conversation and, and Ms. Walsh has been fantastic in that particular process. So very thankful for her to be on that team. So I know all of our board committees, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the board committees that are serving on the teams and what their role is in regards to communicating back to the board committees. 
Yeah, do you want to jump? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, the, the committee members that are on the team, first of all, we're really grateful that they are willing to give their time to us. Um, the intention was for, um, for them to use the expertise they've gained from being on those committees to contribute to the team. The messaging back to the committees um, would really most appropriately come from the Board of Education because they're since they are board committees. So um, in terms of engaging those um, committees, that would be best done through the Board of Education um, liaisons. We will be making sure through superintendent updates to keep you all updated um, and informed. But we also want to be really careful that um, we don't get ahead of the Board of Education. I would hate to have something end up in front of a committee that we haven't talked to the Board of Education about yet. So um, that's why, they, that's why we, they would represent the um, expertise of the committee. But the communication loop, I want to make sure, starts um, with uh, staff to our Board of Education and then our Board of Education to their committees. So I think that's where I was getting a little nervous as you started talking, that um, the board would be the communication, but we're not in the committee meeting. So I, that's where I just really want to make sure we have clarity on what those talking points are. And I, I know um, this would be probably a great topic where we have very succinct talking points yep. after committee meetings that actually those liaisons are empowered to speak to those talking points. I just think we all need to be on the same page and I totally agree. We don't want anyone yep. getting ahead of anyone else. Um, and so really thinking very strategically about how we communicate around what's happening I think is really important. I think a component that we want to navigate in this process is how do we make sure when we're giving information, there's a clear sequence behind that. So as we engage, it's not only going to be just the Board of Education, but that idea when we talk about intentional engagement with key stakeholder groups, it's going to be us visiting with those groups so we can give context to the conversation. Because my greatest fear, even with talking points, is you can still lose context in the sense of what we're doing. And so what our hope is, is when we do those rounds of engagement with key stakeholder groups, is we have people who have been sitting in the meetings to make sure there's context given to those conversations rather than trying to read an email, which I think can sometimes be copied and pasted and becomes a new narrative. What our hope is, how do we make sure we have clear rounds of engagement with, with key members of the groups? And that's the commitment they, you did sign up-ish for it. Um, in this particular process, they'll be a part of that component of meeting with those, those um, key subpolar groups to, to go through that. So we do want to make sure the context, to your exact point, is a, is a big part of that process. But we will make sure we're providing regular updates to those groups as well. And last question. I think I'm saving the hardest for the last. Um, so have we thought about how we dovetail community engagement opportunities on the potential need for 5B? Um, because it, it all impacts each other. And with multiple rounds of engagement, it feels like it's a wonderful opportunity to help people understand yes. choices. We all have choices to make, so. Yes, um, thank you very much for that. And in fact, um, an even larger question is, how does this um, process dovetail into 5B? In other words, um, is, is 5B, we're going to bring a new proposal to you all for 5B based on updated information because of course the original 5B proposal was in preparation for a 2022 um, uh, 5B election and we now have three year ahead of where we were before projections for enrollment and information so that we can and information from our voters where we can really refine what's in 5B. Um, so part of the question is how does 5B itself dovetail with um, this, these pairings of schools. And I think there will be some synergy there. And yes, of course, any engagement opportunity that we have um, with our stakeholders, I do agree that it's really important to talk about both because there is, um, there's no way to talk about 
growth without talking about decline, and there's no way to talk about decline without talking about growth. Because one of the challenges with our enrollment numbers as a district overall is that in our averages, you lose both the intensity of the growth and the, dr the, dr the dramatic drop in certain areas of the decline. So um, yes, they dovetail together very well, and they will dovetail together even better. Um, so I just, just a point of clarification, 5B is not yet approved <laughs> to move forward. So I just want to make sure our public understands that that's not, yes. thank um, you. the potential ballot yes. initiative. Yes. I'll make <laughs> sure I use that language. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then just first, thank you everyone who showed up. I really appreciate you guys taking your time out of your Tuesday evening to be here at our board meeting. Um, really appreciate you guys being here and showing your support for, um, this growth and decline timeline. I want to say, I know this was a lot of work and I'm excited to see that we actually have a timeline now because I know last time we were like, well, when's it going to happen? What's going on? So this is really helpful. And I'm really glad that you're going to be keeping the board in the loop just so that we're not asking 10,000 questions on the last day. Instead, we can kind of ask them along the way. And, um, and also for our public, I just think it's good that we're... Um, giving them information as we move along as well. So thank you, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, on to number 19, compensation and benefits updates. Good evening, everyone. Come on, join me. It is a pleasure this evening um, for Ms. Schleisner and myself to present to you on, on updates and proposals for already school year 24-25 compensation and benefits. And as you know, what you'll hear this evening is um, definitely relates to um, our board end statements around the recruitment retention and showing value for our amazing outstanding educators and staff and also supporting um, and, and reinforcing a positive culture and climate. So as we look back into this current school year, um, we are in a school year that includes an investment of over 25 million. So that's inclusive of not only increases as of July 1 pre-mill, but also post-mill successful mill levies. So thank you very much again to our taxpayers out there. Thank you very much to our community. So um, a combination of compensation increases um, historical, and we were pleased to be able to provide flat um, premium increases to employees. So although our increases um, for benefits increase year over year, in this school year, our employees did not pay those premium um, increases for their benefits. Um, also, some one-time um, increases or, or supports in relation to um, bridging and um, in preparation in 4-5A, such as our retention stipend as thanks to our employees, an additional one-time personal day, and we added other one-time pieces as well as part of those short-term strategies we presented this time last year, like tuition reimbursement, horizontal lane advancement, and then a pilot, couple of pilot programs for our employees on discounts and free lunches, of which we're really excited um, to give you an update today about. All right, you stay there. So the first thing we talk about when we're talking about compensation is what is ongoing revenue going to look like next year. So it's not quite as much as last year. Last year was close to $32 million increase in ongoing revenue with that PPR or per pupil revenue. So um, two things. First of all, we have less in inflation, which helps to set that base, which we'll call that good news. I guess we have less inflation. And then secondly, we're still a declining enrollment district. So we're projecting to be down 946 in enrollment from the prior year number. So the governor's budget, which is based on September's economic forecast, 
took us from 10,145 per student to 10,823. And then CDE, the Department of Education, updated those numbers with the December economic forecast and took that number from 10,823 to 10,925. So that's our current projection. So that would give us 16 to 17 million in new revenue for next year. So with, with this um, uh, earlier timeline of announcing raises or bringing raises to you or potential raises, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. So advantage is just retention and recruitment. So keeping those current employees as hiring season starts with our district and other districts, and then also recruiting those new employees um, into our schools as we're starting a lot of the recruiting fairs. And then the, um, some of the disadvantages, we don't know that revenue number until we know the revenue number. So these are our best estimates right now. Those numbers could change at any time. It's unlikely, if we look back in history, those numbers have stayed very close to the governor's budget, but you never know what's really gonna happen. So we're pretty confident in that number, but we are committing to 16 million of ongoing expenditures. And so decisions would have to be made if that revenue number came in later, either staffing adjustments or using fund balance. Thank you, and I just wanna thank you and your team. Um, Ms. Doan, thank you so much as always um, in your brilliance um, in partnership with Team HR and, and Cabinet for always being a think tank with us. So in terms of proposed pay increases by employee group, um, for licensed employees, we're proposing this evening an average increase for licensed employees um, pertaining to all three schedule drafts that you've received this evening, an average of 3.5% applying to the base for all regular status teachers. So this is not pertaining to retirees, the, the 110s, those that are seasonal coaches, things like that, substitute teachers, so regular status teachers. And that would bring uh, the general schedule up to a starting salary of 51,400. If you think about it, at this point last year, when we were standing up here, our starting um, salary was at 45,209. So um, it's really exciting to see a year later a proposal of 51,400 which puts us um, much more at a competitive advantage. Again, thank you so much um, for all of the support out in the community and thanks to all of you um, for the results from this past November. Um, our other starting salaries on the other two schedules, just to, for our hard to hire and our extremely hard to hire slash specialist schedule, 55,808 and 61,535 competitive, which is wonderful. Um, those that fall in oversell, so those that don't fit into um, their pertaining sell for their year's experience and education um, level, as we did pre-mill, pre-mill levy, um, would go, we would go back to the practice of receiving a one-time stipend. Um, and then um, looking into the future, um, there could be a recommendation of having those that fall into oversell not receiving um, an increase, the goal would be as we get closer and closer to catching all individuals up to being on sell as people advance on the schedule, they would all, in an ideal state, we're getting closer each day, they would fall into their cell so they would be eligible. Superintendent Kane, is there anything else you wanted to add on that? Yeah, um, so we, um, we have to return to this practice because um, if we continue to give ongoing percentage increases to um, people that are over their cell, we exacerbate the pay equity um, challenges that, that we have within our system. So um, all of the folks that were over cell did receive an ongoing increase as part of um, the mill levy override. But now we really have to have the discipline to try to get everyone um, on the schedule. So that's why we're kind of doing this grandfathering where they'll get a thousand dollar stipend um, one time, but then going forward um, oversell, they will we'll, we'll continue to move the schedule up and eventually we'll catch up with them so that they can continue their progress, their progress um, on the schedules. 
Um, that's a really common practice and it's something that we need to be disciplined about in order to fully implement the salary schedules approved by the board um, a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that you all understand that and see that. And again, all of those folks received um, significant ongoing increase as a result of 5A. So, but we've got to have, we really have to look at those top edges of our salary schedules um, in order to make sure that we're being equitable to um, the folks that are earlier on in the salary schedules, as well as people that have the same um, experience and the same level of um, degree in theory, that's a very much a pay equity issue. So we're happy to take questions about that at the yep. end. Thank you very much. Um, in relation to non-licensed employees, so classified employees, again, a 3.5% increase and admin pro tech, so other, all other staff, a 3% with the same um, practice being applied for those that fall over their range as a one-time $1,000 stipend and the same um, applied for those in future years of not receiving an increase. It applies the same practice of um, going back to the pre-mill levy um, pay practices for pay equitability and also ensuring that we are unwinding the things that got us into the tangle in the first place, which was what we were charged with doing um, a short handful of years ago. Um, we were pleased to be able to um, provide year-round unlimited horizontal lane advancement for our licensed staff. So that's where they can submit for university um, credits to advance on the pay scale um, um, and uh, receive pay increases at, at any point in the school year. Um, for And that, again, was another effort um, as we were preparing for um, 5A. And for school year 24-25, we are going to, again, honor um, submitting for horizontal lane advancement, but allowing one submission, either to advance a lane per year or a full degree, which is um, within alignment with other school districts as well. And we do, and please know we will communicate this out system-wide as we do annually in our practices it's important that our staff remember that we wanna to check to make sure that we're doing so with accredited institutions and programs because at um, any time those can change um, based on Colorado Department of Education's accreditation um, processes. So we'll continue to work with our licensed staff on those processes and reminders. This is just a little note about the horizontal lane advancement pause. We'll talk to our teachers and communicate this out clearly. We'll have a brief pause. It won't impact them. It's not going to impede them from being able to submit and receive their advancement. But we need to pause that just for a brief time so that then we can send out pay increase information and in teacher contracts for the following school year. And that would be from April to June. Um, our free, did you want to share about this or I'm happy to too? This is a very amazing success. So um, yeah, I'm happy to talk yes. about this. So remember that we offered free lunches to our employees last year and they love it. And it's a great chance for us to show off the amazing things that our nutrition services staff does. It's not the lunch that I grew up on for sure. <laughs> it's really good. Um, so we served 186,000 lunches. Um, an average of 2,000 lunches per day for just employees. So really have um, a lot of people taking advantage of this great program. And, you know, I just looked up the average cost of, of lunch. And depending on if you make your lunch at home or go out to lunch, which we all know that's getting really expensive to go out to lunch, it's, an it's between $4 and $15 for lunch. And so that's saving our employees between $700 and $2,600 per year to eat lunch for free um, at our schools. And then the other great thing is the um, before and after school program. So we have employees that bring their kids to the before and after school program and take advantage of that. We offer a 20% discount to our employees to use that. So we have 230 employees that have access to the, that program. Um, representing 340 kids, and it's saved actual amount of 34,000 for our families this year. And a special thanks to your um, staff 
who um, have taken this on and just with a smile and it was a, a big endeavor and, and just thank you, special thanks. Uh, just a quick update from the sub office. So here is a comparison um, of sub rates across the metro area as it stands a couple of days ago. We are fairly within the ballpark except for um, one district is a, an anomaly out there. And um, uh, our fill rate continues to be successful. So to have an average fill rate of 93% or in the 90% range is very successful. So thank you to our substitute teachers out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we are proposing a daily um, base rate increase to $160 a day. Um, although our base or our uh, fill rate is successful, um, we believe that by raising it um, to 160 a day, um, that is being proactive to be within Jeffco. Um, uh, we don't need to quite be in Cherry Creek's range right now because our fill rate is is where it is. But it it helps us to get a little bit closer without being reactive or being proactive. As usual, here's a snapshot of our spring timelines, um, all things human resources. So March 1, we start to flow job postings. Um, we'll do so with our special education jobs first and then flow all of our um, other positions. Our Colorado um, job fair, the statewide job fair that we had the honor of hosting here this year is now up north. Uh, we'll keep fighting to have it back here, but um, it'll be in Adams 12 this Saturday, so we'll be up there. Um, trying to um, um, hire as many amazing teachers for Douglas County. And our benefits open enrollment period um, is already right around the corner, starting April 22nd. Usually it starts in May, and we will communicate this far and wide and, uh, wide and everywhere. Our employees actually said, could we back it up a little bit? May is a busy time of year. Could we back it up a little bit so we have a little bit more time to focus and pay attention to benefits, receive more information so that they aren't crunched um, to enroll in benefits or change our benefits um, in those last few days of May. So um, we are pleased to be able to make that adjustment. Um, we'll bring more information forward and share that out in the system. In terms of benefits, um, it is our desire, it is our hope that we would be able to absorb premium increases for employees again, as we have historically. Um, as shared earlier, benefit increases are not going down. It's, it's, um, they're going up all across the metro area. Benefits are not um, inexpensive. So we'll be able to bring more information back at a, a future board meeting, but please know that that is what our hope would be. Um, and then these are just our other dates of um, annual dates to approve. Uh, contract templates, and then our, our compensation statements. Um, thank you for your flexibility in years past to kind of back it up so that we can get information out to our, our teachers and employees um, in time before the end of the school year. So this evening, um, our staff recommendation is um, the proposed licensed salary schedules um, that you've received and also an increase, which are, is inclusive of the average of 3.5% increase for licensed employees and then a 3.5% for classified staff and three for admin pro tech employees. And with that, we're happy to take questions. Director Thompson. Thank you. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Sure. Um, just trying to understand the oversell versus being on sell. Do we, so starting, um, do we have staff that's under sell? So everybody's at sell or, okay, fantastic. And then for those that are over sell, um, those are staff, I could assume, are veteran staff. Okay. Mostly yes, we do, yes. That they are, they are earning more than their education attainment shows, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and then the percentage of staff that have, if you know, roughly, um, three years or less experience with our district, what percentage of our staff is that, our teaching staff? I don't have that with me, but we can get that to you. Okay. I, re I think I remember being like around 50%, right, is like newer staff. I also don't want to speculate without okay. going and calculating um, that number, but we, we do know, generally speaking, if you look at a, um, a heat map of our mm -hmm. salary schedules, we have lots of folks in that um, zero through five range, and then 
lots of veterans and not so many in between. Yeah, okay. Um, I, yeah, I just know that we have quite a few newer staff in our district, and of course there's a benefit to our veteran staff. Um, and so making sure that we're doing a great job taking care of them. Um, the uh, other question I had was about the pause. Um, the, does that cause a delay in getting a pay raise? That pause period for the um, education, the, I forget the acronym for we, HRA. Yeah. The, the horizontal lane advancement, we would make sure it wouldn't impact them in a negative manner. Because okay, because I was like, that's a prime graduation time. That's what I was asking. It's usually you get like your program finished in like May. Right, right. They usually would get their transcripts um, later on in the summer from a, a graduation period from a university. So it's just a, it's a, a brief pause so that um, our four employees who process that for yeah. the entire district would have a, could do this and then we could do that. Okay. Thank no, you. That addresses that concern. Oh. And then, sorry, the last part, um, uh, just the free lunch slide. I mean, it's just, that's, uh, that's huge. That's a huge number of meals served. How is our, um, food service staff holding up? <laughs> it's a great question. They do, so not only are we now feeding employees, but they're, they're feeding almost all of our kids with healthy meals for all. So we, again, we have really small staff and they're having trouble hiring their kitchen staff also. Um, and we don't have, we didn't build our kitchens for this capacity because it used to be 30, 40% of our kids would eat lunch and then kids would bring lunch. So. It is um, a lot of work, but they love so much what they do that they are hanging in there. But thank you for asking that. Superintendent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add on the horizontal lane advancement. Um, we do make it effective mm -hmm. when their transcript is good. So yes. even if that's a little bit back in time, we do do that. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, an answer to the question on what percentage of employees. So of our current licensed employees, approximately one third have been in a licensed position with DCSD for three years or less. Thank you. Isn't she amazing? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Director Geiger. I, and just a general question. We are a slightly declining enrollment, one, two percent a year. Do we see a commensurate drop in our employment? I mean, as we lose kids, do we also employ fewer people? And is, I understand, there's no way it's an equal amount, but is there some sort of correlation between those two? The, um, the funding that goes to our schools does decrease, and they are solely making decisions to adjust programming or class size or whatever they do. So there are a lot of different decisions that are being made in our different schools. Eventually, it will have to adjust as it continues to decline. So. Um, there are a lot of different decisions being made and sometimes tough decisions at some of those schools. But those are often, almost always, made at the school, to, at, at the principal level, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Director Myers. Thank you. This is a much brighter picture than it was a year ago. And uh, thank you to our public again. I, I think they're seeing... Uh, we already had great cultures in our school, but now you're just are really helping out our teachers and knowing how expensive it is to live in this district. So thank you again to the public for doing this yes. for our teachers. Just about the, those lunches, I one of my teacher friends literally calls me and says, the salad bar is like her highlight of the day. Yes. So <laughs> it's, like, it's a real thing. Um, anything else? Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so then that moves uh, the board to look at the resolution Doo -doo -doo. Um, regarding approval of employee compensation pay increases for the 24-25 school year. Do I have a motion regarding that resolution? Move to adopt a resolution of the Board of Education regarding approval of the employee compensation pay increases for the 2024-2025 school year. Motion by Geiger. Second. S second by. Just say it, Tim. Just, just second by Meek. Just say it. Just, 
get in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? All right, Geiger? Aye. Meek? Aye. Moore? Aye. Myers? Aye. Thompson? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passes seven to zero. Thank you so much. All right, on to the Board of Education reports. We are we were we added an we added an agenda item to talk about uh, the board retreat that we just had on Saturday. So um, I'll just start really quickly just to kind of give an overview. I thought we had very productive conversations. It was a long day, but full of really good information and discussion. So. Uh, we talked about our desired state of the board, covered our norms, um, and then Director Thompson brought forward a communication, um, gosh, document, <laughs> it was a packet, <laughs> it was a communications plan that um, we're going to continue to uh, look at and work towards uh, potentially, I think we're going to talk about it again in April is what we determined there. And we also had our crisis team come in and chat with us about their processes with communication and such. And then Director Meek did uh, a great job talking to us all about policy governance. And we talked about our ends and what, what they currently look like in a potential of how, what they could look like in the future. And we're gonna continue to work on those. I think we, t we said uh, in March, or no, sorry, the first meeting in April, uh, April 2nd, we were gonna come in early to start working on those and then continue to work on them through our retreat in uh, the summer. And then we had a long discussion about our board committees and what we wanted that to look like as a board. And we talked about who was gonna be a liaison. So I'll let everyone, um, when we do our board, um, when everyone talks, you can say which committees you're on. I, as uh, Kelly Pointer said, I am back to the DAC. Um, it rhymed, so had a ring to it. But anyway, back on the DAC. And um, so I'm gonna be there and then also gonna stick with doing the community, and the communication or the connections plan with Director Meek and then also doing some governmental things when they arise for uh, the board. And then we talked about board self evaluation and, and what that looks like. I think we decided on a plan to move forward. Um, Director Meek is going to bring forward in March kind of the first steps about that. And then we will come up with a, a good timeline of how that's going to look. And then the afternoon was pretty exciting. We had all the board committees come in. There was anywhere from one to I think like six from LRPC, um, people that are committee members that came in and we had really, really good discussions about first the survey that was sent out to each of the committees. We were able to kind of digest those and talk to each committee as we broke into separate groups. And then we also talked about bylaws and potential changes to that and what their desires were and then what might work as a board to maybe streamline those. And then we had a report out and we talked about next steps and we're gonna do a communications plan. The one thing that we did talk about uh, potentially changing was the norms uh, that we have for school board members, just adding a small clause at the end of uh, one of our norms. It says being, res being respectful, open, direct, and transparent in our communications, especially when dealing with difficult, sen sensitive, or controversial matters. And then we were just going to add including to the media. And that was uh, what we had discussed at that meeting. So we will look at doing that potentially in March. So that's all I'm going to say. And then I will start down with Director Moore and then come down and give your reflections. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank Director Meek and Director Thompson for the work they put into the um, communication plan and for the um, board governance discussion that we had. Fabulous thought processes and a lot of work. I know you guys put into those to bring those to us. And I, I felt like it was an extremely productive retreat having been on a lot over the years and all of them are good in different ways. This was an exceptional one for me. I enjoyed getting to know all of you better. Um, and I especially really enjoyed the interaction with the committee folks. 
Um, I'm going to be sitting on the long range planning committee and sitting on the safety and security uh, committee of the superintendent. And um, I have a lot to learn on all these things, but I really got a lot out of their discussion with long range planning as well. So thank you all for welcoming me. Director Geiger. Um, the, the, I've done these before as a member of LRPC, and to come at it the other way was, was fascinating. Um, I think our continual um, analysis of our norms or our communications is extraordinarily vital. Um, this group of seven has not been together very long, and having policy norms will allow not just this group but future groups to be able to communicate and make progress on difficult issues in, I think, a productive way, and I thought... I thought Saturday was productive, and I was very happy with that. Um, I think there was a lot of value in the policy discussions that we had about the communications plan, and I echo uh, my thanks to uh, Directors Meek and Thompson for the work they put in. I also want to uh, state that I think uh, President Williams did an excellent job organizing it, and I appreciate all the work that goes into just hurting this particular group of cats. <laughs> and so... Um, I agree that uh, meeting with the committees was important. I think it's an indication that we need to continue to do it. Um, one of the issues that most of them raised is that they don't know to what extent their recommendations are brought to the board, and I think we all kind of resolved to be better at that. Um, finally, I want to thank staff, uh, the crisis team, the superintendent, other, other members of the staff that came in on their Saturdays and gave us information. Um, we do this volunteer. We know that we're going to have to put in the occasional Saturday. I do appreciate paid staff giving up their weekends as well, particularly Ms. Brock. And so um, I thought it was valuable. I look forward to further discussions based on what we had. Thank you. Yep, I agree. That was a great summary of what the retreat was about. Um, I really like the direction we're heading as far as simplifying our ends and um, making the executive limitations uh, more correctly worded. And um, as far as committees go, um, it was great seeing all, uh, or not all of them, but most of the committee members there. And I remain on the FOC and the MBOC. And um, it was also a neat idea doing a survey and getting feedback from our committees on what's working and what's not. And I hope we can improve upon that. And um, yeah, it's great overall. Yay, I get to go before Director Meek. <laughs> we did quite a few things together, though, in the last couple of weeks. Board reflection, the retreat reflection, that's all right now. Oh, okay, <laughs> ditto to every. Okay. <laughs> ditto on the board retreat. It was great to have our kids. And I'm also staying on my same committees, um, SAG, DCYI, DCCF, and I'll stay on Rimsel, and then we will move off in June. All right. Um, so, yes, thank you. Again, um, I echo the same statement. Thank you to staff and to our uh, committee members that came on a really beautiful Saturday. Um, so it was a, an exceptionally nice uh, February day. <laughs> and so it is much appreciated. Uh, I, I know that I gained a lot from... Um, the presentation, especially from the crisis response team, it was very helpful. The uh, the presentation on policy governance, again, Director Meek, thank you. It is really helpful. Um, I love that we're moving in this direction um, uh, to really lead um, using a true po policy governance model. I'm looking forward to us monitoring ourselves as a board. I'm looking forward to updating our ends uh, statement. So just across the board, really looking forward to some of these positive um, changes that we'll be undergoing. Um, one thing that uh, we did discuss, it just hasn't been mentioned yet, is we did discuss the possibility of starting a bond exploratory committee. Um, and it was decided or discussed <coughs> that um, that we'll go a different route with that. Um, and maybe, Kane, you would want to chime in to explain what that route might look like instead. Um, and then uh, it was really helpful to listen to committees uh, going through the survey feedback and have an opportunity to ask them directly um, what they, how they interpreted the feedback, um, especially I know I looked at, and I should have pulled it up sooner, um, 
well, and Brad mentioned it, was one was just making sure that we're communicating better with our committees. Um, and that's back and forth communication and what could that look like, as well as communication with um, acknowledging our committees and the work that they do while we're up here. And then finally, uh, the bylaws, we did have a conversation about bylaws. Um, we did, I learned that some of our committees do have um, some gaps in their bylaws. Uh, MBOC for life is what I learned on Saturday. <laughs> There's no end term to MBOC um, according to their bylaws. So um, again, that was really useful that we reviewed those things and that we are working towards a way to, um, to kind of streamline it and, and have it make more sense for our committees. Liaisons, that's what I meant. Oh, my liaison assignment, okay, sorry. I'm with uh, FOC and I will also um, be sitting in on the safety and security. I'll start with my liaison assignments. Um, I will continue with DAC. Um, I'm starting officially with the student advisory group and I'll stay with the foundation for Douglas County Schools and continue working on the community connections plan. So I am having to step away from one committee um, because of all the other stuff. So unfortunately, I'm stepping away from long range planning committee, which um, I will miss all of those brilliant wonky individuals and I'll stop in and visit when I can. Um, so for the retreat, I, I think it was extremely productive. It was really a fun time to spend together for a full day of talking about how we work together. I really appreciated collaborating with President Williams on the agenda and working together on that. Um, a huge uh, thank you to Director Thompson for the communications plan draft that is out there. I honestly think a lot of conflict comes from communication, you know, um, you forget to communicate with a certain person for a certain reason or copy people. And I think the more we can just kind of put things in writing, I think that will really help us moving forward as a board. And um, speaking of communicating, I think we should probably should share all of the survey results with all of our community, um, our board community members. So I wonder, all, all of the board committee survey results that we went over on Saturday. Only a few people saw that from the board committees, but I think all board committee members would probably appreciate having an opportunity to see those. Um, they are posted publicly, um, but I wonder if maybe we just send them an email with the results too. Um, it was really great to get feedback from our committees. I think it's great baseline data for us moving forward and um, working with our board committees. They all volunteer their time and anything we can do to make them um, feel heard and um, continue to work on those relationships is great. And I think that is everything for me on the retreat. Great, okay, so now we will move the president report. And I, I'll start with you just after I'm done. Yeah, after, well, Kaylee and then you, right? I'm sorry, Director Weiner. All right, so uh, next meeting of the Board of Education is to take place on March 12th. Agenda planning for that meeting will be this Thursday, February 29th at 10.30 a.m. Um, besides the retreat, I had the honor of attending the Girls and Women in Sports Luncheon, where we got to celebrate five women from each middle and high school. Uh, to say these women are inspiring and impressive <coughs> is an understatement. <laughs> we have a lot to be proud of in Douglas County. Um, congrats again to all the young women who were honored. Dr. Weiniger. Um, uh, I attended an FOC meeting with Director Thompson um, a couple Thursdays ago, and a big item discussed was a survey that they took around one of the priorities we assigned them, which was to explore contingency plan options if the 2023 MLO bond does not pass. So um, staff put together a survey for what they would prefer us to do since the bond did not pass. And there were two number one, and you all received a memo around that, but I just wanted to expand on it. There were two number one um, options that they chose. 
The first one was a grant called Building Excellence Schools Today. They thought we should go after that. And the second one that tied with it was um, going for a bond again. And then after discussion, um, they realized they weren't fully informed around that grant and that it is a very small chance that Douglas County would be awarded that grant. Um, and so they kind of more so agreed upon the bond being what the, um, truly should be the contingency plan. And they would love to hear more around that and um, what staff has to say around going after a bond again. And then they also um, had a question on what expenditure priority should be. Um, and the first choice was staff compensation. So um, I'm sure they totally agree with um, what was presented today. They got a brief um, presentation on that as well and no concerns there. So um, yeah, it was a great meeting and um, I'm excited to remain on the committee as a liaison and Director Thompson, you can expand on that if I missed anything. It's so nice to have someone else on there with me. <laughs> All right, Director Myers. So I think the highlight of my last couple of weeks was definitely on February the 15th. Director Meek uh, set up CASB Student Day at the Capitol. So it was, and through our SAG kids. So that was the first time, you know, we were, I was even aware of something like that. And she reached out. We had, well, we had about eight signed up, I think, and we had a few that, that missed. And then we got there, and there were some kids from Chaparral High School with their parents, and they were asked by their, or encouraged by their AP teacher, I forgot the name, though, maybe you know, uh, to come. So we got to sit with them and, and be with them, and, the, and parents, uh, meeting that we had board members there, so they were kind of excited to get to talk to us. And I think there were close to 100 students that were registered for that day. And we got a really special treat because Director Meek reached out to our representatives. They met all of our representatives, uh, Bob Marshall, Brandy Bradley, Lisa Frizzell, Anthony Hartsook, uh, Eliza Hamrick. And then Eliza did this amazing tour. We threw open the big old windows in the room and got to go out on the balcony area. And I think my number gets higher, but I think we did 600 steps to the dome. But it was, by the time, it was unbelievable. But the kids really just had a great day. And I think the ones that missed were kind of sad that they did miss. Um, Anthony Hartzook spoke with us at lunch. And so we just felt really special that day. We got to sit down on the floor with our legislators and listen to a couple of things. Um, I also went with Director Meek and Director Williams to the annual Girls, Women in Sports Lunch. And I'm always amazed at the degree of, not only are they so, do so well in their sports, they just excel in everything. Their academics, their their life that they do, and they're just, they're just the cutest girls you see up there and just the accomplishments and the proud parents that are there for them. And then on Saturday, the 17th, I got to go to the Castle Rock Chamber Winter Frost Gala with Superintendent Kane. And she, and then we had some others there. Um, Jana was there and Stacy and a few of us others, but she won the award for Advocate of the Year because she is out in the community, she's in the public, she's out there advocating for our schools and getting our our community involved in especially 5A and it I don't imagine she'll be tireless when it comes to 5B so that was quite an honor to be there with our district and for her to um, get that award. Um, I know she always brings this up at uh, the beginning but we don't want to forget our outstanding youth awards that um, actual award event is on April 29th and I did mention last night in SAG that I always like, I, I'm always encouraged to bring a SAG kid in. And one of my girls came over and said, Can I go with you this year? And I said, You sure can. So it's kind of nice to get to bring a student along. And then the, we had the SAG presentation that we were at last night, and Director Meek was not ever to able to be there, but Director Thompson came to kind of help me out because with Director makes policy governance and us starting to explain this to our kids. They're a little overwhelmed, but I think they were very receptive to understanding that to have truly voice, they need to look at policy and not operational. And I don't know the number of hours of work that Director Meek 
did on that. But uh, my goodness, they were really receptive to pulling it around to all of their presentations looking towards policy. Superintendent Kane also gave a presentation on 5B, and Sean Walsh was there, our consultant. And at one point, he turned around to me in the meeting, and he said, wow, these students are really asking deep questions and comprehensive questions. They, he was quite impressed with the kids. So, and then my last thing that I never really report out on very much is Rimsel. We are in the process of hiring an executive director. Tra Chad Burns is stepping down after 13 years. And just to know, uh, we've been on interviews for the last two days, and just to let you know, all of these districts, and this is a this is a small school of about 340 students, and they represent six districts, and Cherry Creek and Douglas County will be going off in June, and they're having the same conversations, declining enrollment, staff retentions, and staff recruitment. So it's, you know, it seems like it's just us, but it really is everyone that's facing that, and how are we going to fix all those issues? Otherwise, I think that's all I went to. Thank you. Director Thompson. Okay. Um, so, really great update on the SAG. Um, I don't have really anything to add to it. Uh, it, it the students were fantastic. It was I really enjoyed um, seeing their presentations and hearing about the different topics that they're interested in and how they were applying their new knowledge on um, board policy to their presentations. The uh, FOC, great, I think you covered everything for the FOC update. I think that was excellent. Um, that is the same understanding that I had of um, their update on the survey results and what occurred, so thank you there. I. Um, I know it's not customary to uh, acknowledge public comments, um, but I do want to take this time to acknowledge the continued courage displayed um, in public comment by the Gansey family. Racism is never okay. Our students should absolutely feel welcome in our schools regardless of their race, ethnicity, or identity. And we should be providing the tools for our staff to appropriately address incidents of racism and bullying. I do think as a board that we need to take time to address the raised issues and review our policies to see how we can better serve our students. I do think it's beyond reasonable for us to explore the asks that have been presented in public comment, um, especially in addressing things such as hate speech and proactive alignment with recently passed legislation. Um, I did pull it up while they were um, talking, and I do believe that some of those items, you know, that we do do as a district, but it would be nice to know where we, where we align with that law currently. Thanks. Director Meek. Well, thank you, Director Thompson, for, for bringing up the public comment. I was also going to comment on a, a couple of themes. Um, I'll, I'll start with um, thanking those who showed up tonight to speak on their concerns related to racism in our schools. Um, it does take courage and listening to their comments tonight, I would like to investigate Senate Bill 23-296 um, with preventing harassment and discrimination in schools, and then also understand a little bit more about the other bill that was mentioned, one six, uh, Senate Bill 162, best practices to prevent discrimination in schools. Um, we heard some really powerful statements, and, which are not always easy to listen to, and I think we have policies, which means we really need to look at whether or not um, we're following those policies and what's happening in our schools, and it's an extremely important topic for all schools, honestly. Um, the other public commenter I wanted to public comment I wanted to mention was around the questions around the cost of 5B. I felt like that's worth addressing as well. Um, the commenter ended with asking whether the board intentionally misled the public about the cost of ballot measures 5A and 5B, and I would like to answer for myself, it would be no. I did not intentionally mislead our taxpayers. And the second question, given the cost alone is double what you stated, how do you intend to rectify this with taxpayers? 
it is my understanding that the calculations are including the tax increase that is just purely part of the assessment value going up. It's not the part that the dis it's not because of 5B. So I think it's really important that we have accurate information and um, perhaps that's something we might wanna speak to in the future just so we can have absolute transparency and make sure the community understands what actually transpired. So I, I definitely just wanted to speak to that public comment tonight as well. Um, so let's see. I think everyone else gave most of my updates. <laughs> <laughs> the day at the Capitol was extraordinary. I've been to the Capitol, I don't know how many times. I've never been all the way up to the top of the dome. And having them get the key and take us up on this, this tour, make the students feel as special as they did with answering questions and showing them around. It, it was really extraordinary. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, the only other thing I have is the DAC met on February 15th as well, and the DAC is sending out a survey to our school accountability committees related to budget priorities, so that will be all transpiring in March. Um, we'll be hearing a presentation on the calendar committee process, and let's see. The DAC is also researching putting out a survey to SACS asking for their input on communication channels that work the best for them. So those are the big topics with the DAC. And with that, um, Girls and Women in Sports was amazing. So you see smiles every time we get to go to events with our students and see just how incredible they are. So that's it for me. Director Geiger. And pardon me, since I wasn't able to attend all of the meeting on February 13th, did anyone do a readout from the LRPC meeting of the 7th? Did you do that, Director Williams? I talked about how they're doing okay. MCP and... Right. Yeah. I do want to point out, that's the best meeting of the year. <laughs> I showed the you, paper, too. Because you get the paper. <laughs> so, um, and I welcomed Director Moore to the board by giving him my extra copy. So... Anybody who's been involved knows how precious that is. So I won't do anything further from that. Um, it is probably a good idea that director reports are this long after public comment um, to let things marinate and sit. Because um, some of the things that are said about you are challenging. Um, but they are also what you do if you're an elected official. Um, there is always. There is room literally in every district in this state to address issues of bias and bigotry and racism. And we have been specifically called out because of concerns by something that happened. Um, I have looked again at the Senate bill cited. It looks like it is directly addressing some of the concerns I've expressed about a formalized necessary process for reporting it and investigating racism and hate speech. Um, I look forward to hearing from administration and from the Colorado Department of Education about how we're gonna implement those and how they're gonna be put into place. Um, that is something that all I can do is promise that I'm going to continue to be on that because while process and policy do not solve everything, they are the first <coughs> step to creating and continuing to create a welcoming and thriving environment. Um, I know it can't be easy as a student to come here and talk about that. I know it can't be easy as a mother to come here and talk about that. And I know it cannot be easy as a member of, of the community to come here and talk about that. And I appreciate everyone who does. Um, they don't have to believe me that I'm listening, but I do promise that I am. Thank you. Director Moore. I uh, definitely echo and <clears throat> support the comments by Director Geiger and uh, all the directors, Director Meek, Director Thompson, all of you about what we've learned tonight during public comment um, and how that you know, impacts 
what we do and the decisions we make. And I certainly appreciate the community always coming to, to tell us what's on their mind. And I think it's important that we consider everything that we've been told. Um, you know, the, the comments about, in particular, the comments about the, uh, you know, 5A and the, and the uh, concern that the school district was not forthcoming and how much it would cost. I, I think it's crystal, I think to Director Meek's point, you do have to really rely on accurate information and not um, a perspective that might not be <clears throat> complete. And, you know, when the school district for 5A made its, made its um, uh, pitch to the community on what this would cost, they relied on assessed property values from, I believe, 2022, which is how state law works. Property values are assessed every other year. And so in preparation for the ballot initiative, there was no way to know what property values were going to be for 2024. Um, and any organization that has to go to the taxpayers um, and does anything related to property values has to rely on the most recent values, not what the, the, the potential um, upcoming values may be. And while um, it's not inaccurate to say that um, folks may have end up end up paying more in property tax values than um, what anybody would want, including myself. I had almost a forty percent increase in, for my own personal home. Um, the The values of two thousand and twenty two and the values of two thousand and twenty four are vastly different, and we couldn't have known what those were going to look like yet. In addition to the fact that we were all promised. The legislature, when they went into special session in November after 5A had already passed, that they had hoped to pass some sort of legislation that would reduce what the 2024 property values might look like. Unfortunately, that did not result in any significant changes for anybody, but that was also something that could have changed the end result on what it cost individual homeowners. Um, it did not ultimately change because the legislature did not change anything. But that is not, I do not believe that it falls on the responsibility of a school district to have somehow tried to forecast what property values were going to look like when we really just didn't know. So, um, Secondly, I, I just I had the really awesome pleasure of attending a, f a fundraiser kickoff yesterday. Um, there's a committee created a little over a year ago. It's a committee to uh, do a memorial for Kendrick Castillo who we all know was tragically killed in 2019 at STEM school. And uh, uh, I've been sitting on this committee long before I joined the school board. Um, Director uh, Peterson was on that committee. It's a committee made up of uh, county staff, citizens, John and Maria Castillo, um, uh, HRCA, Highland Ranch Metro District, several other organizations sit on the committee. And we, we worked over the, a period of time to come up with ideas and locations and funding thought processes on what would be a proper memorial for somebody who did what Kendra Castillo did um, at STEM school. And yesterday's kickoff was, was awesome. It's uh, the plan is for a physical memorial in uh, honor of Kendrick in uh, Civic Green Park in Highlands Ranch. And the Douglas County Community Foundation is the entity that's going to be raising the money to pay for that memorial. So yesterday's kickoff, uh, there was a plaque unveiled that denotes the location where the memorial will go. And um, I just uh, was very impressed by all the community collaboration that came together in lieu of something so special to recognize somebody that um, sacrificed so much for our community. Um, it was good to see everybody. And I already got some information today that the DCCF is already um, like wheeling and dealing hard on the fundraising effort and going to make some things happen pretty quick. So it's a pretty special event. That's it. All right. Item number 24, convene an executive session. The Board of Education has issues to discuss in executive session as follows. One, to discuss the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real real property pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024A related to the purchase of real property located at 10235 Park Glen Way, 
Parker, Colorado, and two, to confer with the board's attorney to receive legal advice related to the purchase of real property located at 10235 Park Glen Way, Parker, Colorado, pursuant to CRS 24-6-44B. Do I have a motion to go into executive state session for the previously stated purposes? So moved. Motion by Weiniger. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Moore. Any discussion? Great. All right. Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. We will now be going into executive session and the following individuals will be joining the members of the Board of Education in this session. Aaron Kane, Superintendent. Danelle Hyatt, Deputy Superintendent. Rich Cosgrove, Chief Operations Officer. Mary Kay Klamesh, General Counsel. Liza Meyer, Executive Director of Special Education. As long as it's okay with Superintendent Kane, I'm guessing everyone else can go home. <laughs> and, um, and then we will, the, the live uh, streaming will no longer continue after this, uh, but we will adjourn from open session when executive session's over.